Okay, very good. Uh, all right, well, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to uh, join you guys, and I very much thank the uh, conference organizers for the uh, for the invitation and for finding a very uh, creative way of dealing with the perennial uh, problem uh, I pose at these uh, at these meetings. So thank you very much. Um, and um, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, some work that's um, uh, really a, a, a report, uh, a, a status report of, uh, of something that's occupied a lot of my uh, um, thinking and efforts over the course of the pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, something which is uh, right at the moment, I think in a, in a very exciting place. Um, uh, we don't understand everything about it yet, but I wanna tell you what we do understand about it and uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, set things up for the what should hopefully be the final installment of, of the talk on this uh, subject at whatever the next uh, amplitudes, uh, relevant amplitudes uh, meeting is. Um, so uh, uh, th this is work that really has its uh, uh, genesis in the uh, in the work of Song and Yang Tao Bai and Gong Wen Wine on the uh, ABHY realization of the isosahedron and uh, tree level scattering amplitudes in uh, trace phi cube theories uh, has another uh, big leg um, and uh, motivation from the general picture of string economical forms and uh, binary geometries that was also developed with Song He and Thomas Lam. Uh, but uh, this work and the, the sort of status report, as I said, over the course of the pandemic is um, been uh, in collaboration, wonderful collaboration with Hadley Frost, uh, Pierre Lee Camondon, Julia Salvatore, and uh, Hugh Thomas. Uh, okay, so uh, I've, be, I've begun with some version of this um, slide in, in every Amplitude's uh, meeting for the past decade, uh, so I won't go through it uh, in, in detail. But the overarching question that uh, a number of us have been pursuing uh, uh, for all this time is to find a different question that really lives in the kinematic space that defines the uh, scattering processes to which the amplitude is the answer, rather than thinking about amplitudes as uh, as the unitary evolution in Hilbert space and uh, local causal uh, evolution in space time. Uh, so we'd like to see the, 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 the rules of quantum mechanics and space time as outputs and not inputs. And what we've been seeing over the past decade, but really starting in 2017, directly in kinematic space, uh, is a set of ideas that uh, that involves some geometric combinatorial geometric objects that live directly in kinematic space. So positive geometries in kinematic space that began with this sort of kinematic space description of what the amplitahedron is uh, in, uh, in in the work with Hugh Thomas and Yara Trinka back in uh, 2017, and then. That opened up uh, that, that opened up uh, the, the sort of possibility of thinking about very general theories in this in this way, and led uh, um, and and led to this uh, ABHY picture of the isosahedron for trace phi cube theory. Various avatars of it have been generalized in beautiful papers um, uh, by others uh, to uh, find the P theory uh, for general P, and this was developed uh, through to the end of uh, 2019. Uh, through to one loop uh, as being associated with cluster algebras and cluster polytopes. So that's the sort of jumping off point, and that's what sort of teed us up to uh, be able to uh, work on this uh, uh, subject very intensively over the course of the pandemic. The broad clues that there is uh, um, such a structure in uh, kinematic space that we should be looking for is, first of all, the very striking fact that really goes back uh, to uh, Stashev's original realization about the, the amazing properties of the isosahedron, uh, that if we just imagine all the cubic graphs um, uh, for a phi cube theory, the planar cubic graphs in a phi cube theory, that all of those diagrams could be arranged as the vertices of an interesting polytope where all the facets reflect partial factorizations of the amplitude. That's a highly non-trivial property, highly non-obvious property. Um, uh, that the, the pole structure and what poles go together, the compatibility between poles uh, has, a, has a polytopal character. Um, now that uh, remarkable observation is associated with a hidden symmetry that the amplitudes have. Uh, and the, the symmetry becomes uh, manifest when you talk not about the scattering amplitude directly, but uh, uh, about a differential form that lives in kinematic space. So if we think about the, the kinematic variables is just loosely to, uh, here denoted by the x's. These are the, the, the uh, momenta squared and all the propagators. Um, uh, then uh, we might think that every Feynman diagram is just a product of one over the propagators, but we uh, uplift that to a differential form that lives on the space of uh, the uh, Mendelssohn invariants. 
So instead of one over X, we look at the, the sum of DX over X or D log X, but they have to be weighted with particular signs. That's the, that's the non-trivial thing. It's possible to weight this form with non-trivial signs such that the form is actually only a function of the ratio of the X's and not of the uh, overall scale of the X's themselves. So we call this projective invariance. And, uh, and in general, there are many, many, many more equations than, uh, than signs um, uh, uh, to be chosen in order to check whether the form is projectively invariant. So it's highly non-trivial that it's possible to assign signs to each one of these forms to make the entire form projectively invariant. Um, nonetheless, this is something which is a direct consequence of the existence of the underlying polytope structure. And this projective invariance is an analog for a trace phi cube theory of dual conformal invariance for n equals four super yang mills. And as dual conformal invariance does, this too has consequences for the amplitude. Um, it implies that the amplitude vanishes more quickly than you'd expect in certain directions in kinematic space and is associated with new recursion relations to write the amplitude um, uh, in a way that makes uh, the symmetry manifest term by term. Um, so, all right. So. Now, uh, uh, this is the form, and we can take the form and pull back to a certain subspace, that's a subspace defined by uh, ABHY, to get the actual amplitude. So if you take this form and you pull it back to an appropriate uh, subspace, and you pull off the overall volume form, you get the, act uh, the actual amplitude. Uh, so this is also not obvious, that it's possible to take this form and pull back so that all these minus signs go away and just get all the sum of was all plus signs. Okay? So all these three things are sort of qualitative clues to the existence of this uh, underlying structure. Okay, so what we're going to do now is talk about. Uh, let me just tell you about the the uh, the theory that we're going to uh, be talking about, or at least start off talking about. We're going to be talking about uh, trace phi cube theory um, uh, to all orders, so to all loop orders and all orders on the one over n expansion. So it has nothing to do. This is a non supersymmetric theory. It has nothing to do with planarity. It has nothing to do, um, and it has nothing to do with the. Uh, uh, right. It's a non-planar, non-supersymmetric theory. We are working though in the one over n expansion. So, uh, so in the one over n expansion, we use double line notation to draw, uh, if we're drawing Feynman diagrams, so these are some uh, representatives for five point scattering. This is tree level, this is some two loop planar correction. This is a, a one loop uh, a double trace uh, correction. Uh, this, is, um, this is a one loop single trace, but uh, higher orders than one of Ren uh, correction to a single trace amplitude. And all of these things can be uh, dually drawn. The duals of these graphs are certain surfaces. Okay, so I, uh, and, and they're in fact triangulations of surfaces. I'll review this again in a second. But uh, just the zero order point is that the, we, we just have the sort of standard connection between Feynman diagrams and surfaces. Um, of various genus. So, so we go from a disk to having two punctures, to having an annulus for this double trace guy, to having this torus uh, with a single uh, puncture and, and, a, and a boundary component with the five guys, since we're talking about five point scale. All right, so, so the things that I wanna uh, talk about is uh, first, uh, just in the field theory limit and just talking about the integrand, the, the usual um, uh, stomping grounds so far of the story of uh, positive geometries. So we'll be going beyond that uh, in this talk. But so first I wanna tell you about uh, what the all order amplitohedron is um, for this uh, trace by cube theory. Now the beginnings of this were already there um, in my talk at amplitudes last year, um, uh, where we called these objects clusterhedra um, and they were really sort of direct, uh, moving directly uh, uh, off from uh, the one loop story that we had seen uh, associating these objects with the uh, cluster polytopes. As we'll see that uh, while the, the cluster structure is almost exactly what's needed, it's not quite exactly right. Okay, so we're not calling them a cluster hedra anymore because they're not really associated with the, uh, with the cluster algebra. Uh, and instead, they're really more directly naturally associated with the surface. So that's why we're calling them uh, surface hedra. Okay, so this is something that uh, that I think we've understood since the winter and has been talked about in a number of uh, uh, in a number of talks. Uh, and what we've been doing uh, since then is um, is is moving on, trying to see how much of the story that we understood before uh, can be extended to, to again the entire structure. So all all uh, all loop order, all orders in one over n. And here the key idea was that of a binary geometry associated with these uh, with these polytopes. Uh, I'll review what this is, but 
But in the old story at the tree level and, uh, and at what we'd understood at one loop, and even the one loop story is, is part of what's being slightly modified as we go from plus three to a surface zebra. So I'll be giving you, um, I'll be giving you a simpler uh, picture of what's going on at one loop and a more complete picture of what's going on at one loop. But in any case, uh, for, all, for all of these surfaces, uh, we now understand that, there's, that, the, that this notion of a binary geometry generalizes, and that allows us to define uh, 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 the, the notion of string economical forms uh, and the corresponding string amplitudes for all surfaces. And what we're doing now is uh, smack in the middle of exploring what these amplitudes look like, uh, what their analytic structure is, what kind of functions you get, and uh, what's really going on with these amplitudes that now make sense. They have a new parameter alpha prime, just like string amplitudes, uh, and what they look like. Um, but I, uh, what I'll tell you about are some uh, preliminary uh, observations about them. Uh, they have the same qualitative structures, all the same qualitative structures as real string amplitudes, as we'll see. And so we don't know what these things are yet. Um, we don't know if it's a new kind of string theory, a new view of what string amplitudes are. Uh, I, I suspect it's likely going to end up to be a new view of what string amplitudes are, perhaps from a more flexible point of view. But anyway, uh, we don't know what they are, but uh, I'll tell you what, what we know about them and what we're trying to understand. And, um, and much of our work uh, in uh, moving beyond the kind of uh, standard uh, so-called finite type uh, cluster cases, uh, where there was some sort of theory to explain where these binary structures came from, the second we move off to what's going on for general surfaces, uh, we uh, we had lost all uh, we, we we had lost uh, the sort of moorings for exactly uh, systematically what to do, um, and uh, so we are just uh, more artisanally uh, hunting around for uh, how to think about the uh, binary structure and where these variables come from and um, and uh, and uh, and how to construct them. Uh, and in in small enough examples, it's possible to do that, and that's mostly what I'll do in in this talk, in the body of this talk. But um, what we've also understood is the systematics of where this comes from, or at least the beginning of the understanding of the systematics of where this comes from. And, uh, and this has to do with not the not the cluster structure directly, but a new structure in quiver categories uh, that underlie this binary map. Uh, so um, something many of you know, uh, many of you know the great Steve Schenker, um, and I learned from Steve Schenker a long time ago, something that I call Schenker's theorem, which is that subject you hate slash fear the most will next be the most relevant to your research. And I never in a million years thought 10 years ago that I would be learning category theory in order to think about physics, but here we are. And this is really a place where it has real beef and teeth um, and, uh, and, and is a deep, more abstract, but sort of deep origin for where a lot of this uh, magic is coming from. Uh, I suspect that uh, in, in the body of this talk, um, the, the, uh, the, the part for which I have slides, we're going to have a lot to do already. Uh, so I'll probably get to talk about the first two things. Um, and then uh, when, when we end and we, we clap, uh, for those few of you who might be interested uh, to hear more about the uh, about quiver categories uh, and where the binary magic comes from, um, I'll be happy to do that just uh, uh, after we clap. Uh, by um, uh, in uh, in real time, not not the slides, but just explaining things in uh, real time. All right. So uh, let's get started. So what are surface ether? Again, the, the claim is that given any surface, and remember the surface are just the surfaces uh, that that characterize the particular order in the one of random expansion and uh, and the trace expansion for the uh, trace phi cube theory. For any surface, um, we're gonna uh, th there's a polytope. There's a facet associated with every uh, arc, a homotopy equivalent class of arcs on the surface. And while in small examples, there's finitely many of these, generically it's infinite. So that means that, uh, and we'll understand where this infinity comes from and what it means, uh, but that means that it's a, it's a, a infinite polytope that has a sort of a fractal structure. So you can draw it in a finite region but uh, if you zoom in on the facets, the facets are sort of shrinking and getting smaller and smaller, and there's infinitely many of them. So that's an interesting practical structure. Now, the vertices of this polytope, as in the story of the isosahedron, are uh, Feynman diagrams. But the facets, remember the facets are associated with, uh, with arcs, and arcs on the surface will be associated with propagators, as I'll, uh, I'll review in a second. 
but the facets reflect uh, a, a geometric uh, feature of cutting or pinching uh, the surface. So for example, uh, if, I have, uh, if I have the disc and I have an arc X, I can see what happens when I pinch X. And when I pinch it, uh, the surface factorizes in two. That's a familiar way that we understand from the world sheet where factorization comes from. But it's just a basic fact about the factorization of the surface. Similarly, if I have a, a surface with a puncture here, uh, uh, and, if, uh, and if I have this uh, arc X, uh, if I cut along X, I open up the surface as much like uh, a forward limit when it comes to an apple. There's another class of arcs in the surface that are very interesting. There are closed loops. And as we'll see, the, the, these guys that go from boundary to boundary correspond to propagators of the trace by cube theory. These guys that are closed loops in the surface do not. Um, but they're also there, they're forced on us by the uh, geometry of these uh, polytopes. And they also are associated with the canonical uh, factorization, which is what you get from pinching the surface along the closed curve. So if I have an annulus, which is the first time this happens, and I pinch along delta, I get the product of two disks each with a puncture here. Okay, or if I have a four punctured sphere, and I take one of these uh, closed, uh, um, sur uh, closed Red circles and I and I pinch it. I get the product of two spheres again with an extra puncture uh, where I did the uh, pinch. So the claim is that the polytope has all of uh, has a facet uh, for each one of these arcs. And furthermore, when you go to that facet, what it looks like exactly reflects the uh, the the cutting and pinching of the uh, surface. This new stuff um, is. Uh, associated with new poles in the in the form, the canonical form that we associate to these polytopes. So there's a new kind of particle that's there in the in the in the in the integrand for the amplitude that was not there in the trace by cube to begin with. And as we'll see, it has the interpretation of some kind of quote unquote gravity. Um, okay. And of course, this picture is uh, it, this is the earliest uh, hint. Of some uh, of some similarity between what's going on in this story and with standard string theory, because of course a, this picture and literally with the annulus is also the first place in which even if you're only talking about open string amplitudes, you discover the necessity of having closed strings. Okay, so so can I ask you something? Pictures uh, 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 associated with this. I'm just drawing for a bunch of surfaces. Um, so th th this would be a, a tree level, uh, one loop, a planar, a two loop vacuum diagram, uh, one loop uh, double trace, uh, and a two loop uh, vacuum diagram. Uh, uh, so these are the these are representative Feynman diagrams associated with each surface. These are the polytopes that are associated with uh, with them. And as you'll see, beginning in these cases with an annulus or the torus, you see the sort of infinity that I was mentioning before, and an even more crazy infinity associated with this, uh, with this picture, that's uh, uh, the picture of the torus with the sort of fractal structure here. On the right-hand side, I'm showing a projection of this three-dimensional picture. When if you look from the top, uh, where you see this, uh, you see this, uh, this uh, uh, fantastic looking um, uh, uh, object, uh, where as you zoom in, you see more and more and more uh, facets in this sort of uh, uh, fractal structure. Okay, so let's uh, uh, let me just uh, say a few basic things in order to uh, lay the groundwork for what we'll be discussing. So again, we're talking about trace by cube theory. So here's the uh, uh, Lagrangian we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm only going to be uh, writing down the trace by cubed interaction. Now by symmetries, I could also write down trace by squared trace by or just trace by all cubed, um, but I'm only writing down the G uh, trace by cube um, uh, interaction. And when I do that, then I have a standard double line notation for all of the uh, amplitudes, the usual uh, to topological expansion. Okay. All right. So um, now uh, there's a there's a there's a very standard but very very nice fact that uh, that the triangulations of um, orientable surfaces are exactly given by these double line notation fat graphs or ribbon graphs. Um, and uh, so let's say you didn't know about, you didn't care about these uh, 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 ribbon graphs, but you, you cared about the surfaces. So let's say you have this surface or any of these surfaces um, and you wanna give a triangulation of the surface. Well, if we're, for simple enough surfaces, it's clear what we mean by, by a triangulation. 
Um, but more abstractly, what we mean by triangulation goes the other way. More, more, more abstractly, a triangulation defines a surface. And what is a triangulation? Um, it's a collection of uh, triangles, and the triangles are x, y, z. You think of the x, y, z as being the edges of the triangulation, not necessarily the vertices. Um, okay, so it's a collection of edges of the triangulation, x, y, z. Uh, I'm allowed to have, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm allowed to have, uh, uh, let's say, both a little x and a capital x, and I think of capital x as being oppositely oriented to the little x. Okay, uh, and so the rule is that if a given x is repeated, either as itself or its capital, um, uh, we have to have both of them. Okay? Uh, uh, or it can only occur singly, in which case it'll be a, uh, a component of the boundary of the surface. So that's abstractly, without drawing a picture of uh, what, a, what, a, what a surface is, it's a triangulation, and a triangulation is just a collection of x, x y, z's where each x can come in a lower or uppercase variety. And if it's, if it's repeated twice, uh, it can uh, mostly be repeated twice. And in that case, it has to come in uh, one, uh, one lowercase and one uppercase, right? So that determines, uh, that determines the surface. And now the vertices are determined by those rules because uh, you now demand that you write any little x as some vertex vertex prime and the capital X as the oppositely oriented uh, vertex prime vertex. Uh, in such a way that, that, that all those assignments of the vertices are, uh, are, are compatible between the different uh, triangulations. So, so uh, that means, for example, if I have a given x, y, z, that now the vertices are thought of as the lines in this double line uh, notation diagram. So in this way, a single trace by tube diagram, just one, defines a triangulation of a surface. So if you just want to think, not, not all of them together, but just one diagram defines the triangulation of a surface. Okay, so here I'm just drawing the same, uh, the same things again, uh, the same triangulations and the corresponding uh, trace by cube diagrams that define the triangulation. Okay, and now what are, the, what are now uh, uh, the rules for translating between, uh, uh, between uh, a picture of the surface and a graph? The edges of a graph are cores of the triangulation. The double line colors of the graph are vertices of the triangulation, and internal closed color loops are punctures um, in the uh, surface. So, okay, so that's the, uh, the that's the most basic thing. Uh, that at the most basic level, the graphical relationship between the uh, triangulation uh, and um, and uh, trace by cube uh, double line notation diagram. Okay, now um, there is something else that we can naturally define, which is if I now draw an arc on the surface, um, we just saw in our simplest examples that they correspond to sort of propagators of the corresponding uh, Feynman diagram, but we can, we can in fact uh, naturally assign momentum to them in the following trivial way. Let's go back to the surface. We know in the case of the disk um, that we're supposed to assign uh, uh, to this arc that goes between, let's say, uh, PI and PJ, the sum of all the momenta uh, in between. Okay? Um, but, uh, but we can actually say that slightly more invariantly by saying that we assign X um, the same momentum as this uh, collection of arcs, one to two, two to three, all the way up to uh, J minus one to J, because the arc X is homologous to that arc on the boundary. And that's the general idea, that the momenta are associated with the homology of arcs. So, um, so let's say I now talk about this uh, one loop example. Okay, so there's a puncture on one puncture on the inside. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, one loop. Um, now uh, I need to give a basis for the, for the homology. So, uh, so I can give the momenta on the outside and I have to specify one more. So let's say this one I call L, but then the momenta that I assign for everyone else is completely uh, determined by the homology. So the momenta for this arc X is given by L plus P2 plus P3, because X is homologous uh, to, uh, uh, to L plus P2 plus P3. Similarly, in this example, uh, uh, if I have this arc and I call that L, then the arc for this arc, then the momentum for arc X is uh, L plus Q, where Q is the total momentum on the inside. And, um, and, uh, and, and for the uh, blue arc is L minus Q. In this way, we unambiguously assign loop momenta to every chord, uh, so every triangulation. 
And therefore, every triangulation of the surface, remember a triangulation of the surface is a Feynman diagram, and that means through every Feynman diagram, we unambiguously associate initial matter to that diagram. So, so this allows us to label, uh, to, to give uh, unique um, uh, uh, labels of the loop momenta of any diagram. But of course, uh, there is a cost, which is that there's infinitely many uh, different triangulations that correspond to the same diagram. Okay? So, um, uh, and so uh, that means that uh, if we think of an integrand, um, uh, the integrand that there's no there's no canonical way of sort of choosing one copy of all the Feynman diagrams. Um, uh, you can do that. It's like choosing a fundamental domain. Um, and in fact, it's very it's it's literally the the issue is literally that the surfaces have a non-trivial action of the mapping class group, and so we have to choose a fundamental uh, domain. So there's an issue of choosing a fundamental domain at the level of the integrand. Uh, but if we but if we don't want to do that. If we just literally take uh, the integrand, um, in these cases, beginning with the annulus, we'll just get infinitely many copies of all the uh, diagrams. Um, uh, and so if we did the loop integral, we'd have some extra factor of infinity multiplying the whole thing that we have to take care of. So either take care of it by, by choosing a, a fundamental domain at the level of the integrand or doing something else. And we'll, we'll come back to talking about that uh, uh, a little bit later. But again, uh, here's an example uh, already in this very, very simple case where we have two, we have, uh, uh, these, these are just diagrams for the same, the same bubble, okay? Um, but uh, but uh, when I go between two different diagrams and I define this thing to be L, then, uh, then uh, I, get, uh, I get different uh, assignments of the, uh, of the momenta uh, for the same diagram. And I can just keep doing this. I can keep winding this picture around more and more and more and more. Uh, the, at the level of the, the, the actual Feynman diagram, it's exactly the same. The arcs are different because they wind around more and more and more, and they're related to each other simply by shifting L goes to L plus P to L plus 2P, uh, and so on. Okay, so that's the action of the mapping. Can I, can I ask you here? So do yes. you know in advance which cuts uh, does your integrand match? If you may. It matches all of them. Okay? It matches all of them. So, um, well, normally you have to relabel, right? No, so, there's no relabeling here. We, I, no, I, I can, uh, maybe, maybe you can ask. Uh, you see, uh, uh, this is different than what happens if you're talking about uh, uh, trying to do it for uh, for uh, for a permutation invariant um, theory like uh, gravity. Here, here, once you have the surface, uh, we know what genus we're talking about, and then it's totally uh, un unambiguous. Okay? Um, so you are mentioning the single cut L square is zero. No, we, we match every cut as it's supposed to be matched. Uh, that's that's the entire point of these uh, polytopes. Is that uh, a, a cut corresponds to taking a given uh, a given uh, propagator and cutting it, and and that opens up the surface. Um, uh, now, exactly the, the the thing is what, what uh, the same propagator shows up infinitely many times. So whichever place, whichever representative you choose to cut. You can cut that one in the integrand, and you'll get exactly the correct uh, residue on that cut. But if you are matching all cuts, well, what is the point of uh, considering all these windings, right? I oh, thought because, that because the, the, you because are there, yeah, because there's no and because adding more windings match more cuts, more cuts, more cuts. Right, because because uh, because there's no canonical way of choosing one copy of every one. You can do that. There are many ways of choosing one copy of every one. Uh, or two copies, or n copies of uh, every one, if you like. Uh, there are many ways of doing it, like there's many ways of choosing a fundamental domain. But there's not a canonical way of doing it. Uh, if you choose one way, then you will match, then, then, then you have a concrete set of labelings in that way, and then when you cut, it descends to a particular set of labelings for the lower, for the lower problem. But the, but, but the choice of, of how the fundamental domain was chosen at the top will dictate what the corresponding choices of fundamental domains look like uh, um, after you uh, factorize. Okay, so uh, so okay. I don't want to talk about the uh, choice of, um, uh, of, uh, funnel, of a fundamental domain at the level of the integrand, because when we're going to be talking about the amplitudes, there's going to be a different way of uh, dealing with this, uh, of this uh, issue, which looks a little bit more natural. But it certainly is possible to talk about the fundamental domain at the level of the integrand as well. I'm not going to talk about it here, but that, that has been talked about in some of the previous talks on this subject. 
Okay, so um, uh, finally, I want to make another uh, important point that while the momenta are labeled by uh, by uh, by uh, homology, um, we actually care about the actual arcs in the problem up to homotopy. So here's an example. Um, uh, so uh, so here I have arc x and arc y. Arc x and y are 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 homologically exactly the same. There's no momentum associated with that puncture. So the momenta that I'd associate with X and with Y, but I, by, by our rules of homology are exactly the same. However, it's very important that we distinguish X and Y um, in, our, uh, in, our, in our approach. That's because X and Y here, for example, this triangulation looks like that. The, the, uh, these are the lines on the other side of a bubble. And if we wanted to associate um, uh, a form with this, we'd have a, for even and an, uh, if we want to associate a form, we'd have one over x times one over y. That if we identify x and y would give us a double pole. Or if we wrote it as dx over x, dy over y, and again if we associated x and y, we wedge them together, we get zero. So either we get a double pole or we get zero. Both of them are not good. So it's really important that we distinguish uh, x and y. And in general, for example, at one loop, we'll have an xij and an xji, and they're different, different variables. Okay, so um, so so we're just uh, warming up to uh, 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 define our object. So let's uh, now just talk about what the space of kinematic variables is that's associated with the amplitude. Okay, so the, the space of kinematic variables is all the homotopy classes of chords on the surface. And as, as I've said, it's generally infinite. Um, uh, beginning with this case of the uh, of the annulus, because these uh, propagators, there's no uh, the, 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 uh, I can define L or L plus any multiple of the momenta on the inside or uh, on the outside. Okay, so so um, okay, um, uh, so so we have all of these arcs, and we also have another set of arcs that don't show up any one of the trace five cube diagrams. As I said, these are sort of closed loops on the surface. Uh, that we, uh, that we uh, generically label with delta. And the momenta that we, the p squared that we associated with that, it's a sum of all the momenta on the inside or on the outside uh, squared. Okay? So these guys are saying, well, are an integral part of the story. Uh, so the, 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 the kinematic variables are the set of x's and the deltas, which correspond to open and closed uh, loops on the surface. All right, another uh, final little point that we'll see uh, in, in, uh, in a little more detail in a moment is uh, what happens when we have punctures. There's something slightly uh, unusual going on. So let's say we have this, uh, this picture already just at one loop. Okay? Now, you might think that you want to draw like a core, but that this would correspond to one of the loop propagators that I drew in my examples. But from the perspective of the surface, there's actually two kinds of loop variants. Um, uh, and, and this is made perhaps a little bit more clear if you imagine that if instead of having the puncture there, you had, uh, you had just a single trace term with uh, so a little annulus with one marked point on it. And imagine what would happen is that momentum goes to zero. So clearly if the momentum of that particle goes to zero, you shouldn't really be able to tell that it's there. And that annulus, the internal annulus should sort of be replaced by a puncture. But if this was opened up, uh, then I can talk about uh, I can talk about loops that wind around this guy clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, and those descend as the momentum goes to zero, not to an infinite number of things, but to two different kinds of chords that keep a memory of whether uh, the, 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 the cord upstairs was, uh, was uh, circling clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, so in the cluster literature, um, uh, this is uh, re referred to as tagging. Um, we can we can think of sort of positive or negative uh, uh, winding variables associated with the puncture. Okay. Well, 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 that's something that we'll come back to. Okay. All right, now I'm almost ready to define uh, what surface hedra are. So um, as, as usual, we first find the kinematic space. So this is the kinematic space that we live in. Um, we've now labeled the kinematic space um, uh, as being uh, associated with the uh, arcs on the surface. Um, and remember, to even define the surface, I have to give you some triangulation to begin with. So you give me some fixed reference triangulation. I can think of that fixed reference triangulation as a fixed reference trace phi cube diagram. Okay. Now, um, 
having done that, uh, there's a natural set of relations that you can write down uh, between these uh, kinematic variables. Now, all of this actually is forced on you when you think about, uh, uh, about the very simple ways of labeling these curves uh, by intersection numbers. And this is related to tropical geometry and all kinds of wonderful things. But uh, you don't need to know any of that um, in order to just see what the, what the simple formula is. So let's say you have two curves, x and y, um, uh, and the curves cross. Well, uh, if they cross, there's a unique way of uncrossing them. Uh, now, in general, uh, if you just draw the surface abstractly, there's a unique way of uh, un uncrossing them. Like if the two curves are like that, I can uncross them upstairs, or I can uncross them uh, uh, sideways, upstairs and downstairs or sideways. However, once you, once you associate them with a particular triangulation of the surface, then there's a unique way of uh, uncrossing. So for instance, if I, uh, I'm gonna denote my surface now by the fat graphs, it's actually a very convenient way of denoting the surface. So this is the actual, this is the surface that corresponds to a disc with four uh, marked points on the outside. And let's say I take this chord X and this chord Y, you see they cross, and, but there's clearly a unique way of uncrossing them that doesn't involve them doubling back on the, uh, along the corridors of the diagram, okay? So if I wanna uncross them, there's a unique way of doing it in A and B. I could have done it the other way. I could have done it, uh, I could have done it sideways, but that would involve doubling back on, uh, uh, along, uh, along uh, uh, some of the corridors. So there's a unique way of uncrossing them without any doubling back. And uh, so uh, these are uncrossing or scheme relations that are now uniquely fixed. So if you give me two uh, crossing chords, then X plus Y has the unique uh, right-hand side. Okay, and uh, I can also have, uh, for instance, uh, things that involve uh, a chord uh, uh, and, and one of these deltas. Okay, so if I take this uh, plus a delta, then uh, if I draw it on the corresponding uh, on the corresponding Feynman diagram, I, I discover that the unique thing that I get is this guy winding around uh, once more. So in this case, if I take a positively winding guy and I add it to delta, I get an even more positively winding guy. Whereas if I take a negatively winding guy and add delta, I get an even more negatively winding guy. So those are relations. Okay. Having uh, said that, uh, this is the sort of conceptual definition of the surface of the surface sequence. Very much as we've seen in, in uh, many places in this story, um, uh, in the positive geometry story, you go to kinematic space, you find a natural positive structure to impose in kinematic space, and then everything everything uh, follows from that. In this case, uh, the kinematic space is just given by all of these x's that are associated with arcs on the surface. And we just demand that they're all greater than or equal to zero. This is very much like the uh, ABHY story for the isosahedron. But uh, we further have to impose the conditions that all the relations, uh, the skein relations between any pair of crossing variables um, has a positive right-hand side. They're fixed to constants, and those constants have to be greater than or equal to zero. All right, so that's the abstract definition of what the surface even is. But it's highly non-trivial that it's possible to choose these CXYs for this polytope not to be empty. And in particular, in the case where we have infinitely many variables for the infinite polytope to exist. Okay, so there's a big story that we don't even have a complete proof for yet, but it works in all the examples that we've looked at, that it's possible to do that, but the CXYs have to be chosen in a very particular way in the infinite limit um, uh, in order for the infinite polytope uh, to exist. Um, it, uh, if I make a connection with what I talked about at uh, uh, Amplitudes last year, uh, that was before we knew how to take the infinite limit. So then we are talking about truncating these uh, pictures to a finite number of variables, um, and then being confident that this polytope existed. That's a little bit like learning to do quantum field theory by first doing it on the lattice. And then after you're confident that it makes sense on the lattice, then there's a delicate way of taking the bare couplings to zero or, or scaling the bare couplings with the lattice spacing to make sure that the continuum object exists. And there's an analog of that here. These CXYs have to be scaled in a very special way, uh, uh, in the case where we have infinitely many variables in order for this object to exist, but it appears to be, uh, to be possible. It's possible in all the examples that we've looked at, we conjecture that it's always possible. Okay, now I'm just to give you some uh, pictures uh, uh, for what these uh, look like in a little bit more uh, detail. So, 
So here are some examples at one loop um, at, uh, the, uh, of what the, uh, for example, the, 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 the bubble uh, looks like a, a hexagon. Um, and here are uh, the vertices of the hexagon are all the triangulations of the, are all the triangulations of the uh, disk. These all correspond to, uh, they, 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 they correspond to the bubble graphs or bubble graphs with a tadpole. I'll, I'll show uh, what this looks like more systematically uh, in a bit. Uh, this is what it looks like for, uh, uh, for three point one loop uh, scattering. Um, uh, we can look at the three punctured sphere. Um, now, now the, 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 three the three punctured sphere are just a trace pi cubed um, uh, amplitude goes. It's just a two loop vacuum diagram. But the, even this two loop vacuum diagram has a rich structure because as far as cores on the surface go, there's a lot going on. Okay, So uh, as far as cores on the surface go, we have many different kinds of cores. And again, uh, the, I, I'm not I'm not showing how this works in 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 detail, um, but these uh, these uh, highlighted facets are reflecting the various factorizations of the picture to a lower to a lower object. For example, here, um, if I look at this green guy, uh, then if I if I pinch along this green guy, what I'm supposed to see is the is the um, uh, is just the two point one loop problem. And indeed, that's the hexagon that I see uh, over here. On the other hand, if I pinch along the red guy, I'm supposed to see effectively a forward limit, which is the the uh, the five point tree problem. And that's the uh, pentagon, which I see uh, up here. And you can decorate all the vertices of, of the picture on the right with uh, with the uh, with the finding diagrams for the uh, trace by cube theory at uh, one loop here for three points. Okay, so similarly here, um, all of the facets of this guy reflect the different factorizations that you get from the cutting and pinching of the surface. This is a particular, uh, I'm just showing you all the three dimensional polytopes that we've seen, um, just because we can draw them. Now here's the first uh, uh, really new and interesting example, um, which is uh, uh, the, the, the annulus with two points on the outside and one point on the inside. So this is the double trace uh, one loop amplitude. Uh, and here we see that um, here we see this interesting infinite object. You see these infinitely many facets getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. All of these guys, all of these facets have interpretations in terms of cutting cutting the surface in uh, obvious ways. For example, if I cut along this red guy, I should just get the uh, I should just get uh, the problem with uh, uh, with one mark point on the outside and one on the inside. And that turns out to be this infinite polygon, which is one of the facets of, uh, of this guy, the red facet. If I cut along one of these arcs, um, then uh, the, 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 the simplest case would be if I cut along a straight one. And again, that's just going to add two more points. And I should get a five point uh, tree level or, or a pentagon. And you see, there's a pentagon. And all of these other guys are all pentagons. They're all interlaced with each other. They're all pentagons. But finally, we have this hole. We have this hole that would be there if we only had these variables that we uh, knew and loved. Um, but uh, but the hole is filled, and it looks like a, a hexagon here. Okay, um, and that hole exactly corresponds to this uh, facet associated with this loop uh, going around on the inside. And as I promised, what that's supposed to look like is what you get when you pinch on that surface. What when you pinch on that. On one side, you get a puncture in just one point. That, that gives you nothing. It's too small. But on the other side, you get uh, you get a disk with two points on the outside and a puncture. Well, that's exactly a hexagon. That's what we saw a moment ago is just a hexagon there. And that's exactly the hexagon that we see in this picture. Okay. All right. Uh, now, in this case, this delta is, as I said, it's forced on us by the polytope. The, the surface heat would have a hole without it. And, and it's qualitatively like uh, gravity. And, um, uh, uh, and it has the, the qualitative property that, we've, uh, that we're used to again in string theory, where we discover closed strings in open string, uh, one loop uh, scattering uh, in the annulus diagram. Uh, but literally in this case, the canonical form associated with the polytope has a new pole with one over delta. The residue on that pole is a particular sort of uh, entangled product of the, of the forms associated with the two surfaces. Uh, and remember, what is delta? What would I associate with delta? The momentum I've associated with it is the sum of all of these p's on the inside squared, which is exactly the momentum that you'd associate 
but the sort of uh, closed string that would propagate uh, uh, between these guys. All right, so, um, and uh, all of this flows just from this definition. All of this flows, the really non-trivial thing is that it's possible to choose these C's, which are, all the equations are consistent with each other and that they're all positive. Uh, and then also demanding that all these X's are positive, as with the ABHY construction of the uh, isothedron, uh, gives rise to these uh, to these um, uh, surfaces. All right. So uh, the the scattering uh, form that's um, associated uh, um, the scattering form associated with all of these uh, with any surface. If I take that form and I pull it back onto the um, to the subspace that I just defined, where, where x plus y minus the sum over z is, is a constant, this gives the trace five cubed integrand. And once again, this is generally infinite because you would have infinitely, co infinitely many copies of the uh, loop variables in the action of the mapping class. Okay. Now, what we were doing last year, uh, um, when I was talking about this, that the amplitudes last year, even though we didn't know it in this language, but in the language we're talking about now, uh, what we can do is adjust uh, I told you that we have to uh, choose the C sort of carefully to scale to infinity carefully to die off an infinity carefully in such a way that the polytope is, uh, is the infinite polytope is well defined. Well, we can just make a ton of them equal to zero. And if we make them zero, that collapses many of these sort of accordion infinite many facets. And we can, uh, and, and we can uh, end up having a finite number of them. And uh, they can be naturally adjusted in such a way that we keep one copy of all the diagrams. See, this is a combinatorial problem, how to make sure you keep one or two or M copies of all the diagrams. We don't know the solution of the problem for totally general surfaces, but we know it in, 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 in many examples. Uh, so, and we suspect that it's, uh, that it's always generally possible to do. So as I said, this is like finding the fundamental domain uh, for the integrand, but I'll come back to this later because uh, um, uh, there, there's another picture for what's going on where we actually get the actual amplitude, not just the integrand, the actual amplitude where we won't need to do this. Uh, again, there is a uh, new poles that are associated with the, these deltas that are something like uh, gravity uh, and uh, the projective invariance that that uh, that remarkable hidden symmetry of the forms again is totally manifest uh, from the existence of the underlying pole. All right, so that's all I want to say about um, uh, surface hedra uh, by themselves. I now want to move on to talking about um, uh, the, the binary geometries and, uh, and uh, amplitudes from the positive geometries rather than just integrands. Uh, but uh, part of the motivation here, it's very closely connected to the story of the positive geometries and the canonical forms. Um, uh, after all, if we have a positive geometry, the way we associate an amplitude with it is to find the canonical form that has logarithmic singularities on the boundary. Uh, and for a general curvy uh, positive geometry, in particular, like the n equals four super Mills amplitudehedron, the big open question of the subject um, is, is there an invariant intrinsic way of computing this canonical form? Uh, the way that we talk about it for equals four super mills is one way or another given triangulation in terms of simpler positive geometries, simpler cells, and then add up the form for all the simpler pieces to get that of the big object. That's not very satisfactory. First, it doesn't make it manifest that such an object even exists, the canonical form even exists, which is why the existence of canonical forms for amplitudehedra is still mathematically conjectural, even though we believe that they exist physically, of course. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and more importantly, it just doesn't give you an intrinsic definition and not something you can just hand a computer mindlessly to go compute the uh, canonical form. But when P is a polytope, um, we know two ways of uh, giving a beautiful intrinsic definition. One of them is that the canonical form for a given uh, for a polytope is uh, an appropriately defined volume of the dual polytope. Uh, that's the earliest one that we knew. And then more recently, uh, we have uh, this intrinsic way of thinking about the canonical form uh, for any polytope, any polytope, but especially one, especially well suited to one which is naturally presented as the Minkowski sum of a bunch of simpler pieces. Um, uh, which is simply, uh, which is this notion of stringy canonical form. Okay, so if you have a, if you have a, if you have, uh, if you have a polytope, uh, with, uh, uh, which is written as a Minkowski sum of simple pieces, and if I take each one of these simple pieces and I associate a polynomial with it, um, uh, 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 a polynomial whose uh, vertices are integer points, uh, 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 
Or if I go backwards, if you give me a polynomial, then I can make it so-called Newton polytope, where the vertices of the Newton polytope are the exponent vectors of the variables in the polynomial. Then if I take weighted sum of those polytopes, then I get the uh, canonical form for this weighted sum of the polytopes by this interesting integral, uh, where I introduce a bunch of positive coordinates. So it's like I'm integrating over a simplex from zero to infinity. In order to make this convergent, I have to make uh, things convergent near x equals zero. So uh, that's, um, uh, that's these factors, xi to the alpha prime, some variables capital xi. And then I can make things convergent uh, at infinity by multiplying by these polynomials are raised to negative powers. Okay, so this is a natural object. It's a kind of a generalization of just the Euler beta function. Um, and uh, and what, what we saw with Song and, and Thomas is that these things as alpha prime goes to zero, um, uh, reproduce the canonical form of the polytope. And sometimes at, fi at, at finite alpha prime, they have especially spectacular uh, properties. Um, uh, when, when the corresponding uh, polytopes are associated with what we call binary geometry. So I, I will say a little bit more about that in, um, as, as, as we go. Uh, now, this was actually a big motivation for thinking about, uh, for spending so much time thinking about these uh, uh, trace phi cube theories, um, because uh, you know, there is a fantasy for a long time, and it continues to be a fantasy, that there is, uh, there is some picture for the n equals 4 super young Mills amplitude that will directly give us the canonical form. Um, uh, since the earliest picture we had for these uh, intrinsic definitions of canonical forms are in terms of dual volumes, the hope was for something like the dual of the amplitude And those are, that's still a fantasy. Um, but since these, uh, since these uh, uh, surface uh, polytopes are polytopes, then we know uh, in principle uh, how to think about their duals and how to write down these uh, dual volume uh, formulas for them, okay? Um, and again, more recently, again, just for polytopes, we have this uh, stringy um, uh, canonical form uh, uh, approach to extracting canonical forms. So we can try to see what both of these look like in uh, for surface ether. Okay, so what I'll talk about uh, today is, um, is, the, is the second way uh, the binary geometries associated with, uh, uh, with the surface hedra, which give us the stringy amplitudes. Um, I won't talk about, but there, there's, an, there's another story uh, uh, where we have the duals of these polytopes and we can write down their dual volumes. And there's actually a beautiful way of, of, that, that turns out to be perfectly suited to this particular, real, th this particular way of describing the uh, polytopes that uh, gives it totally concrete formulas Again, for the actual amplitude um, uh, that connects to and generalizes the Feynman polytope uh, picture that's associated with Schwinger parameter space and the semantic polynomial. Uh, in a very particular way, in a very concrete way, all the diagrams um, at, some, uh, at some loop order can be unified into a single uh, analog of a Schwinger parameter uh, integral. It's not literally Schwinger parameters, but it's an analog of it but not one, one diagram at a time, sort of putting them all together in one uh, mass drum. Anyway, uh, I won't, uh, uh, I won't uh, talk about this today, uh, but I'll talk about um, the, uh, uh, the binary uh, geometry and the three amplitudes. Um, maybe uh, before we jump in, uh, oh, sorry, let me just uh, uh, say uh, the, uh, at least the structure of what I wanna talk about, then maybe we can take a, a, a tiny break and ask for uh, questions. Um, so, uh, Associated with the uh, surface hedra, we're going to have binary geometries. What that means is that with every uh, variable x, we're going to associate some use of x. Uh, and there's a there's a whole there, there's another story here that that connects these uh, variables to uh, hyperbolic geometry associated with these surfaces. So there's a there's a, a whole story of looking at uh, metrics of negative curvature on these two dimensional surfaces. Um, the, the, the space of all those metrics is, uh, is Teich Miller space. Uh, and we can think about all these variables as ratios of certain uh, 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 geodesic lengths in this uh, associated with the arcs um, uh, in these constant negative curvature uh, uh, hyperbolic spaces. Um, I won't talk about where that comes from. I'll, uh, if, if we eventually get there after we clap, uh, I'll talk about a, a more abstract way of thinking about what they are. But in any case, there's a way of associating with every arc on the surface a certain variable u. And uh, then there's something utterly magical 
that these views satisfy uh, the following uh, equation, that the u uh, for any variable x plus the product uh, over all y of uy to certain positive exponents is equal to one. Okay? Now, this is the uh, what we called the binary property back in uh, 2019. See, what's remarkable about this is that this is a curvy surface which captures all of the compatibility and uh, combinatorial properties of the surface hedra polytopes that I was just telling you about. In particular, if you demand that all these u's are positive, then these equations tell you that they all also have to be less than one. And, uh, and these, these, these n, x, y are, are, are only non-zero when x and y on the surface intersect each other. So if they intersect each other, and uh, the, the, those the, the corresponding propagators are not compatible, the, the arcs on the surface are not compatible. Um, but you see, this this surface is hardwiring that in. Um, uh, it says that if, a, if the u's are positive, then uh, by this these equations they all also have to be less than one. But if a given u for x goes to zero, then all the incompatible y's from this equation have to go to one. So unlike these polytopes, which capture all of the compatibility information associated with curves on the surface, but still have some floppiness associated with them that, that's uh, there in the choice of those constants, cxy, these binary things are completely locked. They're totally canonical. There's nothing you can do about them. The boundaries are zeros and ones. Okay? But these are highly nonlinear equations. And it's crazy that, uh, that they're consistent. In fact, uh, you see, there's as many equations as there are unknowns. So naively, you would think that if they had solutions at all, they'll just be isolated points. They don't have isolated points of solutions. They have n-dimensional uh, uh, varieties as the uh, solutions. So the equations are highly non-trivially uh, consistent with each other. And that non-triviality gets even more amazing in the infinite case, where there's infinitely many <laughs> equations, and they're all uh, compatible with each other. Okay? So it's this magical property that allows us to define stringy canonical forms associated with these guys, such that even at finite alpha prime, the, the factorization that we see at field theory is uh, respected. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the factorization of properties of the integrand uh, in the ordinary canonical form uh, in the alpha prime goes to zero limit lift to something that continues to be true at finite alpha prime. That's a totally magical fact. Now, where does this magical fact come from? Uh, the, well, this is the, what I alluded to before, that there's a, there's a fascinating, there, there's probably many ways of understanding it, but, but the one that I'm most entranced by right now, which I've also been learning from the, our mathematician friends in our uh, uh, collaboration, uh, which um, uh, is a certain structure in, in quiver categories that underlie this magic. And as I mentioned right at the start, this is not just some blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, it practically directly hands us, instead of trying to solve these crazy equations, it directly hands us a parametrization of these equations of certain polynomials. If we have an n-dimensional space and n variables, which remarkably satisfy uh, these uh, equations. And amongst other things, it also gives us a definition of the surface hedra as a certain, again, in general, infinite Minkowski sum of the Newton polytopes associated with these uh, polynomials. All right, so um, so that's what I want to uh, uh, what I want to uh, uh, tell you about uh, next. But perhaps we can take a little break and see if there are any questions uh, right now. Nima, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, you introduced, yes, the surface hydra first in the context of uh, by joint uh, scalar theory. Uh, I was, yes, it was unclear to me if uh, a surface hydron corresponds to a single Feynman diagram contributing no. to the amplitude. No, it includes no, no, no. all yeah, of them, right? Yeah. The, thank, thanks for yes. asking this uh, question. Yes, no. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, if you give me one, a single trace by cube diagram can also be thought of as giving me one triangulation of a surface. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what what the surface hedron is doing is giving you uh, the contribution to the integrand from mm -hmm. all the diagrams that have that uh, particular uh, that show up um, in in that 
uh, part of the genus expansion. Mm -hmm. So, the so, so, the, 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 so the, the role of one diagram uh, is the same as the role of one triangulation and just specifying the surface. You want to specify which surface that I'm talking about? You give one triangulation, you give one diagram. It's the same thing. And the fact that these, uh, and you said these cephalohedra are polytopes. The surface hedra are polytopes. The surface hedra are, are polytopes. Now, okay. now, um, they are what generically... exactly the polytope? They always have the same. They always have the same combinatorics. They have the same facet structure. The same compatibilities. All those things are identical. What the literal polytope the inequalities depend on what your choice of initial, uh, uh, what your choice of initial triangulation. Even though all the combinatorics are the same, I mean, all the structure is the same, but the literal detailed inequalities that cut it out depend on your choice of initial triangulation. And these are generically infinite because... And they're generically they're... infinite because uh, they reflect the fact that, uh, that uh, once we start getting to the annulus and beyond, there is no... Uh, the, 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 uh, that while we have a canonical way of labeling loop momenta, um, uh, that comes uh, associated with uh, uh, homotopy classes of arcs. Uh, and so, uh, and since there's infinitely many arcs, uh, we have infinitely many, um, we have infinitely many propagators, infinitely many copies of the same diagram. One way of thinking about it is take the, take the annulus and take any given triangulation and take it and now take the inner annulus and just keep winding it. Okay, well, uh, they're exactly the same at the level of the sort of the, the, the what you'd associate with the with the uh, with the Feynman diagram, uh, but the labeling of the loop momenta changes from one diagram to the next, um, and so uh, right. So uh, so the most natural object, uh, if you don't do anything to it with no human intervention, the most natural object is infinite, and it has all, and it has all those copies. As I said, you can do it. You can do a human intervention. To uh, shut off uh, um, uh, all but finite number of the facets in such a way that you keep only one copy of all the diagrams. That's like choosing a, that's like a choice of fundamental domain at the level of the integrand. Uh, or we can do something different that I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so you will get back to this because you, yes. you did uh, allude to it uh, later on. Yeah, uh, yeah. It would be good if one could uh, get uh, uh, at least systematically one definition of the integrand. Uh, yeah. Well, there, the, as I said, there's a perfectly systematic definition of an infinite integrand. Um, but you want uh, something where, where, uh, where, where, where you where, where, uh, you want a, 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 a definition of a way of choosing a finite number of um, a copies of all the Feynman diagrams. Yes. And uh, yeah, that, that, we, that we, we know how to do in, for example, in this case of the annulus, uh, 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 we know how to do it. Uh, at two loops, we know how to do it, um, but uh, but yes, we uh, uh, it would be good to have a, a sort of a, a combinatorial prescription for doing it in uh, general. Okay, thanks. But as I said, in a moment, I'll be uh, claiming that I'm going to be sidestepping that. In fact, you can start seeing it on the on the screen right right, right now. Okay. Any yeah. other questions? Uh, any further questions? Okay, well, then uh, maybe I'll just uh, uh, keep on going. Um, so, um, okay, so uh, what, so, um, oops, all right, so, now what we're going to do is, uh, as I've said a number of times, you're gonna associate a stringy canonical form um, with, uh, uh, for any surface, Um, and it looks like this. So uh, I, I told you we have these uh, U variables. Um, the U variables can be expressed as uh, ratios of polynomials and some positive uh, uh, variables, little y. So I do it uh, if I have an n-dimensional uh, n-dimensional surface hedron. Uh, I have a alpha prime to the n, the integral over the positive uh, uh, region for the y, d log y, and then the product of all over all the chords U x to the alpha prime. Uh, and the, the exponent is just the p squared that's associated uh, with the corresponding chord. All right, so that's uh, what we've seen already in the story of uh, 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 stringy canonical forms um, uh, and also uh, cluster polytopes at tree level and at uh, one loop. 
Um, uh, we'll be talking about the one loop case in detail because as I said, uh, it, it's already sort of simpler and different than, uh, uh, importantly different than what we're talking about before. Um, but uh, what I wanna point out already at this point, notice that all the dependence on the loop momenta that I see here is in this P squared of L. And since the P is just linear in L, all the dependence on the loop momenta is quadratic in these exponents. And that means that just like we're used to with Stringer parameterization, we can now, in this representation, we can trivially perform the Gaussian loop integral. Okay, so uh, the, the, the dependence on L is just Gaussian, so we can do the loop integral. And after I do the inter loop integral, I'm left with this some integral dNy, some function now where all the dependence on the loops are gone. So it's just a function of the external kinematic invariance and these y's. So effectively, I now have an integral over some parametrization of the, of the space of curves on the surface um, uh, and some function of the external kinematic variables and these y's. Now comes the beautiful point. Uh, the, the obvious point that since uh, everything that I did uh, uh, here, uh, since everything that I started with was, was invariant, for example, in the case of the annulus, uh, by taking the inner annulus and rotating it, that was the action of the mapping class group. That means that, that this whole object will be invariant under the action of the mapping class group. And that means that I get an artificial infinity when I do this loop integral. Okay. That infinity is precisely reflecting the artificial infinity in the integrand, okay, that we got infinitely many copies of the, uh, of the uh, amplitude. So if I first got the integrand, and then I tried to do the loop integral, I'd get infinity, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm representing the integrand as this uh, string economical form. Before doing the integral over the y's, I'm doing the loop integral, which is something perfectly finite. And finally, I'm doing the integral over the y's. Now I will have an artificial infinity because the thing that I'm integrating will be invariant under the action of the mapping class group. And therefore to get something finite, I will simply at this stage mod out by the action of the mapping class group and I'll get something perfectly finite. Okay, so, so this function, so in other words, all of the information about the binary geometry goes into these U's. From the U's, I get this uh, function uh, Fs by doing the loop trivial Gaussian loop integral. Uh, and then finally, the infinity goes away when I'm integrating over the y's, I mod out by the action of the mapping class group to get something totally fine. Okay, I'll illustrate how this works in, in an example, but I just want to say what the general story is uh, going, going to be. So in this way, we don't have to make any artificial human choices in how to regulate this polytonal for thinking about it. Uh, uh, it, 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 it uh, the integrand is left alone as a sort of perfect uh, object and the amplitude itself um, is also its own natural perfect object uh, where, uh, where the finiteness is just obtained by modding out uh, by, the by the action of the mapping class group of people. All right, so now for, for, the, uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll focus on what's going on at one loop um, in both the planar and the first simple non-planar example. Um, and here we're gonna, uh, in the second example is where, where we're going to encounter this infinite integrand problem. And we'll see how the stringy integral uh, naturally resolves. All right, but first let's talk about ordinary uh, one loop. And um, if you were asleep for the last uh, 50 minutes, um, uh, you can wake up again because uh, this is meant to be totally self-contained. You don't, don't, you don't need to know anything about cluster algebras or polytope or, or any of that stuff. You can, um, uh, I wanna give a totally self-contained uh, introduction uh, to what's going on just at one loop, which already shows what a lot of the magic is. Um, and then uh, uh, those few of you who might be around and interested later to see the, the more abstract, deeper origin of this magic from uh, quiver categories, you'll at least see what this, uh, what this uh, structure is uh, buying us. Okay. okay, but let's first talk about what the variables are. So we're going to be talking about one loop, uh, uh, usual planar, single trace, um, uh, uh, one loop diagram. So first let's talk about what all the variables are. So I have the loop variables um, uh, that go from the outside to the puncture. And as I mentioned, there's two kinds that wind around one way and wind around the other. So, so I've just drawn one of them here. So that's Y1 plus. I have these kind of variables between two boundaries. 
Okay, um, those are uh, interpropagators. These are all various kinds of interpropagator. And I have this interesting loop-like variable uh, that in the Feynman diagram are associated with tadpoles. So let me just show you what all these things look like in action. So let's say I take this triangulation, okay? And this triangulation, that corresponds to this uh, double line notation Feynman diagram, and that uh, propagator uh, in purple is that uh, double line in the uh, picture. Or if I take this diagram, okay, so this is the corresponding triangulation. And this guy now, see, this guy is interesting because it goes between, uh, if it didn't go around the puncture, if it went on this side, it would just be a sort of boundary arc. We wouldn't draw it. But it goes around the puncture. And that special feature is reflecting the fact that this is a, a, a the internal part of a bubble on an external leg. And finally, uh, the most extreme version of that phenomenon is when the loop comes in on itself. And that guy, so this is another triangulation, uh, and that um, uh, the, the green and the yellow and the purple propagators are shown in the corresponding Feynman diagram. And you see that this purple guy is associated, this purple loop guy is associated with the tadpole. Okay. So from now on, I'll just draw the triangulations of surfaces instead of the corresponding Feynman diagrams, but I, I hope you see what, uh, uh, what, the, what the corresponding. All right, so let's talk about um, what all of the diagrams would be. What are all the triangulations that we can have um, for uh, just uh, uh, for two external particles. So just the one loop bubble diagram. So it's what we call D2 hat. Um, and let's just draw all of them. For example, I would start with this guy. That's the simplest triangulation. That's what would literally correspond to a bubble uh, diagram, the Feynman diagram. Um, but let's see uh, what, what diagram can I draw that whose propagators are compatible with the, uh, uh, who are not compatible with uh, this one. So for instance, I can take this guy here, this, uh, this uh, propagator, and it's not compatible with that loop from the top because this loop from the top would intersect that guy. Okay, so, so there's this one, and then there's similarly the loop from the bottom here. Okay? Um, now, now that I have uh, this guy, uh, now, now who, who can I draw that's, uh, that's not compatible with the, uh, uh, I just changed one line on this one. Of course, I can go back to where I came. Um, but remember, the plus and the minus sort of correspond, are supposed to correspond to arcs that uh, wind around many times one way or many times the other way. So clearly, those two things should not be allowed, would, would intersect each other many times on the surface. So I can flip from the plus to the minus and then I can just uh, repeat this story symmetrically on the other side. Okay, so so these are six diagrams that I would have, uh, and uh, and I have the um, uh, uh, I have the plus and the minus uh, uh, propagators. Um, uh, okay, and uh, and I have these uh, and I have the uh, tadpole variables importantly as well. Okay, so so the surface hedron in this case is just uh, combinatorially a hexagon. Uh, and this is different than uh, what, uh, what we talked about before in the, um, in the context of cluster polytopes. So at one loop, we have these, uh, uh, we have uh, cluster polytopes for uh, uh, D2. Um, and D2 looked like this. In fact, there was just A1 cross A1. The difference is that in D2, um, the plus and the minus variables uh, that touch the same, um, uh, that, that come from the boundary, and uh, that come from the same boundary point and touch the puncture are to be treated as compatible with each other. And that's actually not natural. That's not natural from the perspective of the surface. From the perspective of the surface, it looks crazy because these are things that are highly incompatible. They're winding around, uh, um, oppositely around the puncture. They're, they're intersecting each other a lot. Uh, so it's, while it's a perfectly consistent thing to do and there are good reasons for doing it, from the cluster algebraist point of view, it's not natural from the point of view of Feynman diagrams and from the point of view of the surface. Okay? So, um, so this D2 hat rather than D2 is what we find uh, more, more natural. So importantly, we are allowing having these variables that correspond to the tadpole propagators. Those were absent in this, uh, in this uh, usual picture. And uh, because of that, that means that, that not all of these things have good diagrammatic interpretations because they're missing the ones associated with tadpoles. Okay. All right. Can At I least uh, uh, a, a clean interpretation Sorry. of the ones associated with tadpoles. Can, can I ask Nima yeah. one more question in the previous slide? 
Yeah, so, so the hexagon, uh, maybe the D2, okay, say one through say one, but D2 hat, at least uh, topologically, it looks like a C2 or a B2 cluster. Right? No, it's not. That, that, that's actually yeah. coincidental. Yeah, that, it's that's, coincidental that, that's, that the topology uh, yeah. is. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. They're here it, it, it's uh, it's topologically the same, but it's really not the same. Um, and uh, yeah, and you you you'll see the, the difference a little more clearly in the next in the next example. Um, All right, thanks. So okay, if we now go to a D3 um, in uh, in uh, 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 so this is the uh, this is the uh, the previous one loop story we had where coincidentally it looked like the three dimensional isosahedron. So, this is a picture of the three dimensional isosahedron, except instead of cubic um, uh, diagrams at tree level for six points, you have uh, uh, a one loop diagrams uh, for, uh, for three external points. However, that's not what we get. That's not what D3 hat is. Uh, D3 hat uh, is what you get when you take the equator of this picture. And you blow it up into a belt. Okay, so you you uh, you 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 blow up everything, all these lines into a little uh, rectangle going around all the sides, and those are associated with a new facet. Okay, these are associated with new facets um, uh, that importantly involve uh, the uh, the uh, tadpole diagrams okay? that uh, that were uh, that were not captured in the same way. Uh, correctly, well, that were captured in a different way, but in an, uh, but in an uh, inconvenient way in uh, D3. And so D3 hat is different than uh, D3. Um, and in fact, now uh, uh, I'm, I want to give you a picture for what these uh, polytopes are. Um, and in fact, a, a totally uniform picture for both tree level and one loop. Okay, so I want to give a simple picture for the origin of these uh, polytopes. Uh, for this, I'm going to go back to something that we already saw at, uh, at, uh, at tree level, um, what we call the sort of a kinematic space-time picture for the tree level associahedron. Um, and uh, I'm going to revisit that picture and show that just, uh, just uh, two different ways of thinking about the wave equation in one plus one dimensions, two different totally obvious ways of thinking about the wave equation in one plus one dimensions give rise to the two polytopes, the tree level isosahedron and this new DN hat. And so, um, and the structure is, uh, is, is very simple and, and obvious without needing any um, uh, background in, the, in thinking about the Dinkin diagrams associated with DN or anything like that. Okay, so this is a totally self-contained and simple thing. All right. So um, uh, we're going to begin uh, 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 with thinking about the wave equation in one plus one dimensions. Uh, and if, if you haven't seen this uh, connection uh, before, uh, it might look like it's coming a little bit out of the blue. But this is, uh, I hope, uh, a story that's uh, somewhat familiar from uh, the, the Amplitude's talk uh, two years ago. Um, so uh, we're going to take the wave equation in one plus one dimensions. and um, uh, and we know that, this, that, that if I work in terms of the light-like variables u and v, that the general solution of the wave equation is just some y plus of u plus y minus of v. All right. And um, now, uh, uh, notice that uh, the fact that there are two functions here, y plus and y minus, is reflecting, we know, the two degrees of freedom that we need in specifying the initial data, because this is a quadratic problem. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so, so here's the natural question. What are the natural ways of just presenting this initial data? Okay, so I just want to sort of graphically present this initial data, y plus of u and y minus of v. And one way of doing it, maybe uh, one very obvious way of doing it, since uh, u is, uh, is a one light-like direction and v is the other light-like direction, is just draw two light-like directions. Okay, so here's uh, the, some u direction, here's some v direction, and I'll specify this initial data just by giving the value of y plus here and of y minus there. Okay. And now if I do that, then my solution, then, then, then I can say that, that x out here somewhere at a random point is y plus of u uh, plus y minus of v. And if I want, I can say it's minus the integral of some current that lives inside this rectangle. If I do that, if I add this current, then I will modify my equation so that du dv of x is equal to the current uh, rather than just equal to a zero. Okay, so I'm going to slightly generalize to adding uh, to adding uh, a current on the right hand side. 
All right, so that's how I think about the solution of the wave equation if I give y plus and y minus on these two uh, light-like directions. Now, let's say that um, uh, I just want to give y plus. Um, uh, well, then I need to put a boundary condition somewhere else in order to, uh, in order to, to fix both y plus and y minus. So for instance, for instance, one thing that I can do is cap this whole thing off along a vertical line and just declare as a boundary condition that x equals 0 on that line. Okay, then if I do that, uh, that now, if I give me, if I, if you give me y plus, then I can determine y minus just by the fact that that zero has got to equal y plus plus y minus minus the integral of the, uh, of the current inside this yellow rectangle. So that determines y minus in terms of y plus or y plus in terms of y minus. Okay? So this is another way of specifying the, uh, the initial data where you just give me things along, let's say the past boundary or the future boundary together with this boundary condition that uh, uh, x equals zero. Okay, so that uh, now, uh, that, that's, uh, that's a continuous uh, problem. Now we're going to discretize this problem instead of asking for the values of x of u and v everywhere inside that uh, diamond, we're going to take some discrete points and just shoot out light rays and bounce them off the, the, the boundaries of the space time in the obvious way. Okay, so if I, if I take on this path boundary a bunch of points, and now I'm just going to label them uh, with the malice of uh, foresight, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, let's say, and I just, uh, I just, uh, I just shoot the uh, uh, light rays out. Then I fill the inside in this discrete picture, and now I can solve for all the x's on the inside in terms of, let's say, x13, x14, and x15. Okay, so for instance, I can solve for x uh, I can solve for um, x24 uh, by <coughs> as x14 plus x26. You see, I have x14 plus x26, uh, uh, sorry, or x24 is equal to x26 plus x14. And then I have uh, the minus the, the total charge on the inside. So I associate some charge with this square or mesh. C14 and with this square mesh uh, C15. I'm just using this general rule that we talked about here that X is the Y minus plus the Y plus minus uh, the total charge on the inside applied to this uh, discrete case. All right, and you can think of the ABHY isosahedron as just specifying all the X's at this uh, solution of the discretized wave equation and just asking them all to be positive so long as the C's are also all positive. Okay. All right. So that's the that's the uh, ABHY isosahedron, and uh, you can uh, having seen that, you can also ask another natural question. Uh, we know that when we think about the wave equation in the continuum, there's a natural notion of a green function, which is um, uh, if you want to know what the solution looks like for a general source, you should work out what it looks like for a delta function source first, and then the general solution is the sum of what you get from delta functions in many places. Well, what's the discrete analog of that? Is I should shut off what the source is, what the C's are, in all of the squares but one. And if I do that, whatever space I get, so I get some, some polytope uh, for general C's, but if I shut off all of them uh, but a single one, that polytope is going to degenerate a lot. Okay? I can think of that as the response, uh, as, as, the, as the polytope associated with a delta function source. And then the full polytope is just the sum of what I'd get by adding up over all those sources. In this case, the notion of sum is that of Minkowski sum. And a Minkowski sum of A and B is just the most trivial thing. It's all the vectors that you get that are the form B and A plus W and B. Okay, so the notion of a Minkowski sum of polytopes is just the dumbest way of adding uh, uh, of, of two polytopes uh, uh, you could imagine, even just any two sets. Um, okay, so. Uh, so, so it's natural then to ask what you get when you shut off all of these sources except in one of these uh, in one of these meshes. And quite beautifully, what you discover is that what you get if you shut off all but a single mesh is that the is that the, the whole polytope collapses to a simplex. And now I'm conveniently representing what that simplex is by just giving you a polynomial uh, where, uh, for example, if I have one plus y one. This is a this is this uh, uh, this uh, is a uh, this is a simplex whose vertices are just given by the exponent vectors 
uh, what I get in the uh, uh, in this polynomial. So in this case, there'll just be an interval between the origin and uh, and the y1 axis, uh, the point one on the y1 axis. This guy would be a triangle with an origin uh, and a point on the uh, uh, at y2 equals one, and then a point at y1 and y2 equals one, and so on. And so each one of these, what I get when I just uh, turn on the source in one of these meshes and shut off everything uh, every uh, everywhere else is a, is a is a simplex and it's these particular simple uh, uh, especially simple simplices. All right, so just keep that in mind. All right, now let's go back to the continuum wave equation. Let's think about another way of specifying the initial data, and this is an, in many ways an even better way of specifying the initial data, a more obvious way, a more Newtonian way which is you just imagine giving the data on a spatial slice, okay? And what do we normally do? We give the data on a spatial slice and, uh, and we give the initial uh, x and x dot, right? The initial position and velocity. Well, here I'm thinking in terms of y plus uh, uh, of u and y minus of v. So what I'm going to do is just give the information of y plus of u as a function of u is just one function on the slice and y minus as another function on the slice, okay? And, uh, and now what am, what am I going to do for x? Well, x at a given point up here, u of e is again going to be y left uh, here at this corner plus y right uh, at, this, at this corner. So I'm going to call it x is y left plus plus y right minus minus the sum of the charge in this triangle. Okay. Okay, so this is another way of uh, specifying the, the initial data associated with uh, the wave equation. And just as before, um, if I want to uh, just specify y plus or y minus or just y of u or uh, uh, y minus of v, I can also give a boundary condition somewhere else. So in this case, I can put another point up here, x equals zero, and just say x equals zero up there. And once again, this will relate y plus down at this point um, to y minus at the uh, next point over. Okay, so if this distance here is L, uh, it'll relate y plus an x to y minus an x plus 2L. And so you see the whole picture is naturally periodic uh, um, uh, in, this, uh, in the horizontal direction, okay? So once again, I can, I can give either y plus or y minus as initial data. Now, exactly as before, I can discretize and shoot out light rays. So let's imagine I discretize the place I'm giving my initial data, here it is, and I'm gonna shoot out light rays. And so I'm going to now make this kind of grid. And you'll notice that in this grid, uh, all the squares are up here, everything is supposed to be zero. Okay, that's my, uh, that's my uh, future boundary there. And all the grids look the same, except I have the ones that, little ones that look like triangles uh, down there. And again, I'm gonna give my solution of the discrete wave equation now as being that X at any given point is the Y uh, left plus, plus Y right minus, plus the sum of all of these, uh, of the constants that I would associate with each one of these um, things, including the ones associated with the triangles down there, okay? Now, amazingly, uh, if you now just look at uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the variables that, that we get um, in this picture, importantly, including the, the sort of difference uh, that there are some guys right at the very bottom here who are different than, than the rest, um, uh, because they're associated with the, these little triangles rather than with the squares. Uh, uh, just the, 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 the variables in this picture are naturally in one-to-one -one correspondence with the chords of dn hat. For example, I could label here, this would be one three, one four, and then uh, this would be for n equals four. So one three, one four is going around uh, and, uh, uh, and it comes back one one would be the like self loop variable, okay? Uh, and then the ones at the bottom are just, there's a y plus and a y minus. And, uh, and, uh, and it's just uh, convenient to label them as y plus j and y minus uh, j minus one. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the whole picture again, is just uh, cyclically rotated as we go in this direction. So the whole thing is periodic in, in the horizontal direction. All right, so the labels we see of the vertices in this picture are exactly uh, uh, the ones that we can associate with the variables of dn hat. And the claim is that if you just demand that you have a solution of uh, uh, that, that you solve for all these x's inside, you demand that they're all positive, when all these mesh constants are positive, that gives you another polytope. It's not the isosahedron, but it's the polytope for uh, dn hat. 
not dn, but for dn hat. And just as before, um, we can ask for this sort of Green's function picture um, to see uh, the, what, what was the uh, interesting in the case of the uh, tree level is that the sort of complicated polytope could be built out of the Minkowski sum of these extremely simple pieces. And that's the analog of the Green's function picture for the polytope. Well, the same thing is true here. Exactly the same thing is true here. We can again ask what are the individual building blocks um, what, what, that we get when we shut off all of the constants except one. And once again, they're all simplices. And there are these very simple, uh, there are these very simple uh, objects. For example, the one associated with this would be a, a, a simplex zero less than y3, uh, uh, y3 between zero and one, so it'd be an interval. The next one over would be y3 less than y4 sandwiched between uh, uh, zero and one, and so on. Okay, so all of these are again associated with the uh, simplices, and uh, I could group them into a polynomial again in exactly the way that, I, uh, that, that we saw before. Um, and here are the, the here are the polynomials that we see. So something between uh, i and j uh, that that reflects the following uh, ordered simplex between zero and one. And uh, here's the notation that we'll see in the rest of the talk uh, for that particular uh, polynomial associated with that. Okay, so um, so that's uh, that's D N hat. So so you see that uh, it's just another way of thinking about the uh, weight equation in uh, one, one plus one dimensions. Uh, one way gives us the um, uh, gives us the tree level associahedron, uh, and this other way gives us uh, this other way gives us uh, the uh, the one loop uh, surface hedron. Okay. Now. Um, uh, what we can do uh, at, at, at both tree level and at one loop, um, but let me uh, jump ahead now to what we do at one loop. Uh, uh, so beginning with these, uh, beginning with these polynomials, we can write down a string economical form, um, uh, where the polynomials that occur in the string economical form are exactly these polynomials, exactly the polynomials that we see associated with these little uh, Minkowski sum, and uh, and simply doing that defines what the u variables are. Okay? So that gives us a definition of what the u variables are. Um, uh, and so uh, here's what they are for dn hat in general. And you can then check remarkably that these things satisfy uh, these binary equations. So that u uh, for x plus the product of y, uy to the nxy is equal to one, where this nxy is literally the number of times that the, the corresponding curves x and y intersect each other on the surface. For example, here is concretely what they are for D2 hat. Okay, so here are what all the variables are, plus their cyclic images. And you can just check that they satisfy these, uh, 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 these equations, where, for instance, in this case, you see some powers of two, because 1, 1 and 2, 2, those curves intersect each other twice. Okay, so we, we see a, a power of two in the uh, exponent there. All right. So, um, Okay, now, uh, so those are the u variables uh, for dn hat. Let's now move on to talking about what the actual stringy forms are. Uh, well, at tree level, uh, we can do exactly the same thing, get the, the u variables at tree level, they satisfy the same uh, structure formula, except now all these compatibility, all these exponents are equal to one. And as I alluded to already, the remarkable fact about these binary geometries is that when ux goes to zero, all the compatible ones go to one. And that means that this integral develops singularities uh, when some of the u's go, go to zero. But because all the other u's go to one, the singularities are factorized in exactly the same way at uh, finite alpha prime that they did at alpha prime goes to zero. And in particular, the singularities even at finite alpha prime reflect the, the, the cutting and pinching of the surface, not just at alpha prime equals zero, but at any alpha prime. Okay? Um, and this, of course, is the Kobanielsen, essentially the Kobanielsen uh, amplitude at tree level. And we sometimes loosely call this the Kobanielsen amplitude, at least I do. But of course, it's not directly related to a known uh, 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 string background, i.e., with massless trace by cube scalars rather than gluons. But I do want to make a little comment that if I thought of this as a physical amplitude for scalars, um, it's not it's not garbage. I mean, obviously it's the usual uh, uh, beta function formula, but it's not the Venetiano amplitude for tachyons, it's not an amplitude for gluons, 
but it does have positive unitary residues on the poles um, for all v less than or equal to 10. Um, so at least it's not uh, space-time dimensions less than or equal to 10, just like uh, the open superstring. So at least it's not immediately dead as a uh, physical suit. Okay. All right, now let's move on to one loop. So we're going to, now, now that we, uh, we know our surface region is dn hat, we have u variables for it. So again, we're going to define these uh, stringy canonical forms. No, we still don't have this business about the infinity and the windings and all that. That's, that's going to start at the annulus. Um, this is still uh, just uh, just at one loop uh, with just a puncture, so we don't have that yet. So I'm going to spend some time talking about some of the uh, novelties in this case. Um, so uh, so here it is, exactly the same structure. I have the uij to the xij, and then I have the, the, the u's for the loop variables, the y. And I have a separate one for y plus and a y minus. And as I mentioned, uh, these satisfy the uh, binary equation. So again, the integrand will perfectly reflect the factorization um, at finite alpha prime. But now, as I mentioned uh, on general grounds in the beginning, where is the dependence on the loop momentum? It's just there in the y. All the y's are just equal to L plus some sum of p's all squared. So we can just do the loop integral as a Gaussian integral and be left with just an n-dimensional integral uh, over the, the, the variables associated with uh, this uh, 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 this n-dimensional modular space. So um, let's make a sort of first comparison with what we might expect in string theory. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it looks like I'm talking about a diagram with a puncture in it. Okay, so it looks like I'm uh, I'm, I'm talking about then uh, I'd be talking about uh, this sort of world tree diagram, but this uh, this world tree in uh, moduli space uh, is n minus one dimension. Okay, so um, uh, if you just mod, if you fix the point, the puncture to the origin and mod out by the residual symmetry, it's an n minus one dimensional integral, while our integral is n dimensional. So that's actually the one, uh, one, uh, one first point is that we should really be thinking about our integral, um, our object, uh, that puncture in the middle is really a little hole. Okay? It's really a little hole with no marked point on the inside. And there's one extra variable uh, associated with the size of that hole. If you want to think about it in the standard stringing point of view, we're not thinking about it in that way. I'll come back to that point in a second. But if we just want to match the dimensions, the thing that we're really computing is meant to be compared with this diagram in string theory, not this one. Okay? And that's actually good because this is what we'd associate with uh, just the pure gluon amplitude uh, 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 on the outside. This is what we'd associate with also emitting a closed string. We'll talk about the relation between those two things in just a moment, all right? Okay, now let's look at the very simplest thing that we can do is the, uh, um, it's just the tadpole, okay? So this would be D1 hat, the dumbest thing in the world, D1 hat. Um, here's uh, an interesting difference, another interesting difference in uh, uh, string theory, especially non supersymmetric string theories have have tadpoles up the wazoo, right? They have uh, tadpoles and infrared divergence associated with tadpole emission uh, all over the place without uh, supersymmetry. And actually, so would we. So would we if we literally followed the rule that said that we'll associate to every arc the momentum associated with that arc. So if I literally followed that rule here, then I would assign the momentum zero to this arc because the, the homology associated with it would give me momentum zero exactly what we uh, expect with the field theory diagram. However, I can uh, 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 totally consistently in defining my integrals, instead of putting zero there, just uh, associate a particular, uh, I, can, I can associate the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, there's no variable, ignore what I said in this example, it'll be relevant in a, in, in a future example. Um, uh, because we don't actually have, uh, there's no variable associated with that propagator here. This guy is just this uh, propagator, okay? So, um, sorry, uh, ignore what I just said about that, uh, 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 about that. But, but one thing that I can do is I can put in a, just to have some control. If I do nothing else and it's just a trace by cube theory, I just get a number from doing this integral, but I can put in a mass. I can put a mass uh, uh, for the scalar uh, running around on the inside, okay? Um, so if I did this in the field theory limit, uh, I would just get the integral DDL over L squared plus M squared to some UV divergent thing. 
But now for us, D1 hat, uh, I mean, the, the form is just the usual trivial interval. So we just get this uh, du over u of one minus u. Um, and uh, so this is what I get, a u to the y, one minus u to the uh, uh, y plus and a y minus. Those are my two kinds of um, tagged and untagged variables. But now what momenta should I associate with those variables? Well, um, the tagged and the untagged, uh, I'm just gonna give them the same Momentum, obviously, they're related by this uh, obvious uh, uh, symmetry. So we'll just give them exactly the same momentum, but I'll add a mass just so I have some a function of something to look at. All right. So uh, so that's the integrand uh, that I would get as alpha prime goes to zero. It would just get me one over L squared plus M squared. But now I can do the loop integral. Okay. Now I can do the integral DDL. I get I just do the Gaussian integral, and this is what I'm left. With, okay. So now I have a function that depends on M squared, and uh, Two, two comics, so you see it's an interesting integrand. Before I used to just have this uh, rational thing in the integrand, this uh, u, this du over u one minus u. Now I have this uh, stuff with a logarithm in it. Um, but just two qualitative comments about it. First, it's totally uv finite. So the, the, the divergence in the field theory is gone, it's cured by alpha prime. And secondly, it's exponentially damped for large m squared, which is again manifest because these u's are between zero and one. So for large m squared, uh, this is exponentially damped. Okay, so this is our first uh, peek into what happens at high energy in these amplitudes that they're exponentially damped. Now, in fact, I, we can give a, a, a general formula for this, uh, for the, again, this is the amplitude now. We're gonna do the loop integral so for the actual amplitude. Uh, what do we do? We, we take xij, uh, we, we're going to equate in the xij and the xji and set them all equal to the corresponding sum of momenta. If I use dual variables, uh, I'd write them as xi minus xj squared. For the adjacent xii plus one, these would be associated with the external line bubbles. Again, naively, I put a zero there, but once again, I can control that. And I can just say, well, there's some mass normalization, so I'll just call xii plus one m squared and say it's a common m squared for everybody. And finally, now the comment I was making before about the tadpoles is relevant. Now all the objects xii, which would be associated with these uh, uh, tadpoles, I'm also going to, instead of saying that they're zero and getting a divergence associated with them, I'm gonna just give them all also a name and I'm gonna call them t. Okay, so we can sort of regulate it the mass renormalization and the and the uh, and the tadpole um, just by giving the corresponding propagated variables names, and and finally the loop variables again the plus and the minus um, uh, uh, loop variables will be identified and again in dual coordinates would be some x naught minus x i squared and we'll integrate over over x naught. And this is the final result. So it depends on the external Mandelstam invariance the x i j as well as a bunch of other parameters. I, I, I added these, uh, just so we see the most general thing, I added the, the mass normalization for the bubbles on the external legs, the tadpoles, as well as an internal mass for the scalars. And so we, um, uh, so the loop momenta are gone. We have this n-dimensional integral over the, over the space left. Um, all the dependence on the Mandelstam invariance is in this interesting uh, combination here. Um, uh, there's the stuff that depends on the tadpoles and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the bubble and the internal masses. And then the juicy part I get from doing the Gaussian integral, um, which gives me an additional dependence on the Mandelstam invariance in there. Okay. So this is a, some interesting new representation of the one loop amplitude as an n-dimensional integral. It's a little bit like Schwinger parameter, but not, definitely not, not exactly. Schwinger parameter for one diagram at one loop would give you an n minus one dimensional integral. This is an n dimensional integral, so it's one more variable, but it's summing over all the diagrams together in one unified object. And again, the loop momenta are, uh, are, are gone, of course. We've done the loop, of course, it's the actual end. So what's the qualitative structure? Well, we know that at three level, uh, we get some n minus three dimensional integral and we get this u to the alpha prime x. So the, the, the singularities here, which occur as u goes to zero, gives me something rational um, as alpha prime goes to zero. But at one loop, here I get u to the, uh, you see from, from this expression that we get from the Gaussian integral, I get something that looks like u to the log u. So, I, so it's positively u to the log u. As u goes to zero, uh, I will get things that are modulated by logs and polylogs and things that have branch cuts. That's where the, 
branch cuts of the of the loop uh, um, amplitudes uh, occur in the field theory limit as as alpha prime goes. Through. Okay, so here's just to, just to con concretely see for the special case of four point scattering, this is what the whole answer looks like. It's a function of S and T, as well as all these uh, external things from the tadpoles and the mass normalization and the internal mass. And all of these expressions are explicitly given. They're just uh, uh, logarithms of ratios of polynomials uh, in terms of those Y variables. Okay? So, if you're familiar with the stringy uh, one loop integrals, there's nothing elliptic in sight here. We don't see any taus. Uh, we don't see modular prime. We don't see anything like that. We, instead, we have these integrals uh, involving these exponentials of logarithms of ratios of polynomials in these variables. So it's a very different looking uh, representation. Nonetheless, it's guaranteed that as alpha prime goes to zero, this matches the field theory limit regulated in the UV by alpha prime uh, in some in some way. Okay, so at the very least, what these things are, are a new kind of ultraviolet regularization of uh, field theory amplitudes, and especially amplitudes as an integral over the corresponding uh, binary uh, positive spaces. Okay, but obviously, since at tree level we got string amplitudes, we want to know what are we actually getting here uh, at loop level? Uh, what is the high energy behavior of this keeping alpha prime fixed? So it's, it's obvious we get UV finiteness in any number of dimensions. It's also obvious that there's part of the kinematic space, which uh, it, uh, corresponds to the positive region in 2 2 signature that we usually talk about in this business, where everything again is trivially exponentially small because of all the exponents in these integrals are positive, and what we're integrating are uh, numbers between zero and one raised to large positive power. But what happens to a three one signature for physical high energy scattering at fixed angles? And um, and uh, uh, we're, we're we're right now you know really busy trying to understand the analytic structure um, uh, of these uh, of these objects uh, more generally, and also so we can do the uh, the discontinuity analysis and check for uh, uh, unitarity at loop level and so on. Um, but just to get an idea of the uh, high energy behavior, it's easy to do a saddle point analysis. And let me remind you how that saddle point analysis for high energy scattering works at tree level. Uh, in, the, in the language of these U variables, um, uh, the action that we talk about, uh, uh, the, 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 the logarithm of the integrand is just the sum of xij log uij. Um, and, uh, and the critical points of this are the, are the, are the gross mendel equations of the scattering unit. Now we know these guys have n minus three factorial solutions, um, but if you look in the physical region, high energy fixed angle, um, and I, I, I don't know actually a, a, a proof of this fact, but it's observationally true, certainly at four points and five points, that all of these, all the saddles have negative action at high energy and fixed angle. Okay, so you get exponentially small amplitude. Now this is not true if you, uh, if you make let's say S large and positive, and t negative, but make the magnitude of uh, negative t bigger than s. That would not be correspond to a physical scattering angle. And that is indeed one of the places where the string amplitudes blow up exponentially. But when you're in the physical region, they die exponentially. And that's, I think, uh, quite an uh, interesting thing uh, and, and, and not sort of manifest from the, uh, uh, from the inspection of, of the scattering equations, especially at higher points, uh, why that should be true, but it, it appears to be the case. Okay, so we can do a similar analysis um, for us at one loop. Uh, I'm going to define uh, this sort of composite object, capital UIJ, which is just the product of the little U's for the IJ going one way and the other way around the, uh, the aperture. So that's a, natural, that's a natural object that shows up. And it turns out that despite the fact that this integral looks a little bit scary, that all the stuff in here is irrelevant in the, for the saddle point analysis. Okay, so that everything just boils down to this part. Um, well, and, and here uh, is, is just that composite that I just uh, defined, the, the product of the UIJ and the UJI. So we have a new set of scattering equations with a new set of U's. And again, I can look at the uh, uh, set of points. Here is very concretely what they are at four points. It's just S log U13 plus T log U24. Here are the U's. And I can just shove that in, look at the set of points. Uh, and now the saddle points, there are three saddles, but amazingly, uh, for high energy fixed angle, 
all three have negative action. So it doesn't matter, you don't have to make an argument about which one is chosen, how you deform the contour, whatever is going on, all of them have negative action. And therefore the high energy amplitude at fixed angle is again exponentially suppressed. This is not true. It's again, not true uh, if, if the magnitude of T over S is bigger than one, but it's exponentially suppressed literally in the physical region, just like uh, physical string theory. Okay, I, I want to make one, one uh, last point about the uh, 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 DN hat, which is that um, in this object that we talked about, there's no boundary in the geometry that I remember I told you we should really be thinking about what we're doing if we're comparing to the, uh, to the, to the usual world sheet as, as an annulus with no marked points on the inside. Uh, but in our story, there is no boundary or no singularity associated with this internal guy shrinking to zero. However, there's a natural way of, uh, there's a natural thing that we can do to our story at the level of the polytone, um, uh, which is motivated by this funny observation that we had these plus and the minus variables. Remember that the plus winding and the minus winding variable. If we go back to this picture of uh, the actual polytope, it has a plane of symmetry uh, where all the plus guys are on one side and the minus guys are on the other side. Okay? So since that's the case, it's natural to slice this guy in half. And that's what we did all, already talked about in our uh, 2019 work where we talked about cluster polytopes for DN is we define what we call DN bar by slicing the guy in half. Okay, well, we can do exactly the same thing now with DN half. We can take DN hat and we can slice it in half. <clears throat> uh, and if we do that, we, we make a new facet. Okay? And this new facet, just as uh, was the case for, uh, for the DN bar story, this new facet has a very nice interpretation um, uh, as uh, all the vertices on that facet are associated with diagrams where you made a tadpole of uh, all possible lengths. So they're all the tadpole diagrams. That's the thing to, uh, to the cognoscenti that's associated with the BN minus one or the CN minus one uh, cyclohedron uh, uh, cluster polytope. All right. Um, but a, a, a beautiful thing is that this full polytope, um, DN hat cut in half, this is something um, that already exists. It's called the halohedron. And it's what uh, Julio Salvatore very early on uh, proposed as uh, being uh, related to the uh, amplitudes. Um, at one loop. Okay, so now the halohedron fits in uh, to this whole story. The halohedron is what we get if we take the surface hedron and we chop it in half. But also, quite beautifully, the halohedron has an effective binary realization. That's because uh, it turns out when you look at the u variables, uh, the u variables have the beautiful property that if the u variables for y plus, for any one of the y pluses, like let's say y1 plus is bigger than that for y1 minus. All of them are bigger. So the U space itself is broken up into two regions where all the U's for the pluses are bigger than minuses and the other way around. And so that means that we can chop U space in half. And once we do that, there is a new boundary. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it's extremely simple to see that, that, that the ratio uh, of these two U's, it, it crosses between bigger than one and less than one, depending only on what are the product of all these Y variables uh, that went into defining the, the polynomials defining these U's, whether the product of all the Y variables is bigger than one or less than one. So chopping the space in two means that the level of the binary geometry that I have to integrate now not only over all the Y's, but all the, all the Y's or the product is bigger than one. And instead of integrating the form that has singularities only at Y equals zero and infinity, it also has to have the logarithmic singularity on this new boundary that I added, okay? Um, but then apart from that, I again just have the product of all the U variables raised to their power as well as, a, uh, as something new associated with this new uh, boundary that I added, which I precisely associate with this new tadpole facet. This guy now has a new pole as T goes to zero. This uh, is interpreted as a new singularity as the internal analyst shrinks to zero size. And this is what's very reminiscent of the closed string tadpole emission that we get. And in particular, the residue is what the, the, uh, 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 the residue corresponds to the form on this, tad, on this T facet. And what is that? That looks precisely like the emission of a tadpole, which we think of as a, close, a tree level close string emission 
off of this uh, one loop uh, tree level open stream process. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, um, so uh, that's all I want to say about um, the planar one loop case. Now, let me make a few comments about the. Uh, now, let me make a few comments about the um, uh, double trace case. So, uh, I'm going to look at the simplest case of of the bubble. Um, uh, Again, but so this is what the Feynman diagram uh, looks like. This is the corresponding surface. Uh, and uh, there are, I, I won't go through it in, uh, in a detail. Uh, there, uh, we, 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 begin, we, we, we begin life with a very, uh, with a simple set of variables that uh, are naturally associated with hyperbolic lengths in this, uh, in this geometry. Um, but there's uh, both for the ordinary variables as well as this, uh, this delta variable, the circle, uh, the, the closed loop going around uh, uh, the outside. Uh, there's a very natural change of variables uh, from these variables to some new ones that I'll call little delta and t. I've written them explicitly here. <clears throat> uh, the action of the mapping class group is just uh, clocking over the xj's by one. And in these new variables, it just shifts t by delta. So the action of the mapping class group is just t goes to t plus delta. And also the canonical form that we want to integrate this d log x naught, d log x1, just turns into dt, d delta. All right, we can then make, uh, and this is where the slightly artisanal part um, of the story comes in. Uh, if we don't know more systematically where does this come from. Um, but there's a, in, in these cases, there's a very obvious guess for what the u variables should be corresponding to the ordinary arcs. Um, I won't go through it in, uh, in the detail, but this is the first thing you would write down if you followed any of our previous story. And uh, you can write this in terms, of these, uh, in terms of these new variables, these t's and deltas in a very simple way. But already something interesting happens. If you take the product over all of these u variables, you find there's a telescopic uh, cancellation in this product, but, but it goes to a fixed finite thing. It goes to this e to the negative delta, where delta is the variable is this variable that controls the sort of length of this uh, capital delta uh, closed string loop. And then if I look at what the Erzot u equation should be, I would take, let's say the variable x naught, and then I would, uh, I would, I would uh, write down the product of the u's raised to the power of the number of times the new variables intersect x naught. So I would get this uh, huge infinite, um, uh, I get this infinite uh, product in two directions with u1, the next curve intersects it twice, so I get u2 squared. The next curve intersects it three times, I get u3 cubed, and so on. So I get a big infinite product here, I get a big infinite product there. And you can just ask, is that equal to one? And it isn't equal to one, too bad. But you see, is it off by something simple? And amazingly, it's off just by this tiny, simple extra factor. So in fact, uh, there are an extended set of u equations, but you have to see the u variables for other things that are not just the obvious chords that you had to begin with, but which also involve delta. And here are what the uh, u equations are. Uh, they're, they're exactly what I said, but there's one more factor, which is this u delta square. Uh, now, why is that power two? Why is it mysterious right now? That's one of the things, anyway. Well, uh, um, but, uh, but it, it's squared. Um, and, and, this, and this u delta you're, you're to think of as a u associated with these loops that just go around. Um, and so they are incompatible with all the, all the other arcs that cross them. So you'd expect an equation like u plus the product of all these u's is equal to one. And that's in fact exactly correct um, uh, because the product of all these u's ends up precisely being that e to the minus uh, two delta as I told you. So this bottom equation solves for, for u delta is equal to one minus that product. And that's exactly what we were off by in the previous equation for the top one. Okay, so first of all, there's this infinite set of equations which, are, uh, which capture the binary geometry. Amazingly, the binary geometry knows by itself that it's incomplete. It needs this extra business with delta, just like the surface even itself knew that it was incomplete and it needed this extra business with delta to be completed. But not only do we have these uh, infinite set of uh, nonlinear equations, we also have a solution to the infinite set of uh, equations parametrized in terms of uh, T and delta in this uh, particular way. All right, so now we can go off and do the integral exactly the same as before. Now we're going to associate with every one of these arcs going around J times. Well, 
we said, what is the loop momentum associated with this? It's L plus PJ, where P is the total momentum coming in from uh, the, the inner analyst here. Okay, so I'm going to say that this XJ is L plus PJ all squared plus M squared. And so, uh, and so here is the integral. Okay, I, I'd have to integrate over delta and T uh, of just D, D, DT, D delta. Remember, that was the D log form. And then just the product of uj to the alpha prime l plus bj squared plus m squared. And also I could, I, I could add a factor of u delta to the power of, uh, uh, of its corresponding delta. Uh, I, I left that out here uh, for the moment. Uh, I want to uh, point out here that if I do this, and if I take the alpha prime goes to zero limit, what I'll get from this is the infinite form. I will get the infinite form where I sum over, uh, I sum over the, uh, the diagrams with the loop momenta shifted by pj. Uh, as I go. So that's the infinitely many copies of the diagrams that we found. But as I said on general ground, so if we first, if we, uh, if we uh, take the, if we take the alpha prime goes to zero limit, or let's say we, we get the string form and then we integrate over the loop momentum, we'll get infinity. So let's do it the other way around. We'll integrate over the loop momentum first, but that's trivial because it's a Gaussian integral. Okay, so, um, and what we're gonna get is an integral dt d delta, some function of t and delta, but this is guaranteed to be mapping class group invariant. Um, so it'll satisfy that f of t plus delta is equal to f of t. And therefore, this integral is going to stupidly give us an infinity, just because it's count counting that infinitely many times. So what, what we should do is mod out by the mapping class group, which trivially in this case just means that I do the integral from minus delta half to delta half, let's say, any fundamental domain that I like. This now is going to be, give me a completely finite amplitude and this infinite overcounting issue is all gone, all right? And here is concretely what we get. Um, so we get, uh, again, uh, from the Gaussian integral, we get something that looks like an exponential of a log log of u's. Uh, this looks like a slightly scary expression, but uh, um, uh, 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 perhaps analytically and certainly uh, numerically, it's astonishingly close to this very simple uh, approximation. So if we take this very simple uh, approximation, we get a very simple form for the, we get a very simple form for the, uh, uh, for the integrand um, that we're now supposed to integrate over T and delta. Uh, and now when we do the integral, now you see that uh, uh, everything is uh, regulated. Alpha prime regulates everything. And um, uh, in four dimensions, for example, uh, uh, if I, uh, if I forget about this uh, power of uh, u delta uh, for the moment, so I just look at the dependence on the usual p squared for the bubble, uh, then uh, you can easily see that as alpha prime goes to the limit, this gives you log alpha prime p squared. That's exactly what you'd expect from the bubble. And it's ultraviolet finite. Again, it's cut off by uh, alpha prime. So there's no infinity, there's no spurious uh, counting, all that's gone, and we reproduce what you'd expect from the low energy field theory cut off by alpha prime. Um, in general dimension, if I now take the opposite limit where I forget about the dependence on the external momenta, uh, but I keep track of the dependence on the power of delta, of uh, u, u, u delta, then I get an, an interesting expression of those poles in this variable, um, uh, that uh, an infinite series of poles that I can really think of as closed string poles. Uh, and amusingly, it's actually massless in d equals four. Um, uh, and we're, we're trying to figure out with the analytic structure how to think about these objects in general, where you turn turn everything on and uh, to really see what the analytic structure is. As I said, uh, both even in the earlier one loop example, as well as this example, to try to understand whether we can do the analytic continuation um, uh, into the physical region uh, well enough to control the discontinuity across the branch cut and check for physical unitarity. Uh, that's something else that uh, that's something that we're, 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 we're in the middle of looking at uh, now. Um, uh, so don't have anything to, to say about that yet, uh, but at least um, at first blush, we have integrals that are ultraviolet finite, exponentially soft in, uh, in, in the obvious uh, uh, positive, uh, two, two positive regime, uh, remarkably, more remarkably exponentially soft in the physical high energy um, fixed angle uh, scattering limit, and which, uh, uh, and certainly give us, uh, uh, give us an, uh, an ultraviolet regulation of the low energy field theory. I want to make a final comment, something else that we're uh, looking at. Um, uh, I, I keep telling you that these deltas are, sort of, are supposed to be associated with gravity somehow. And so if we really put our money where our mouth is, we would expect the following thing. 
Um, if I'm talking about at the level of the integrand, then there are poles associated with these deltas, as I said, but uh, the factorization on those poles has some interesting features uh, associated with it. It's not, a, it's not the most obvious direct multiplicative factorization. It's what we call entangled factorization. It's a very specific kind of uh, factorization at the level of the polytope where you get the, the product of the two lower polytopes, but it's projected down to a lower surface. Um, and that fact that it's not exactly factorization um, means that to see something closer to exact factorization, you have to go down not just in dimension one, but in dimension two. And that's again something that looks correct from the interpretation of where you see the singularities for closed string scattering. We have four point closed string scattering. Um, the, the, the singularities are not seen, when you integrate over one of those, they're not seen in co dimension one, but they're seen in co dimension two, real co dimension two, where you get the long skinny tube connecting two spheres. Um, but uh, but we would think that if this connection is there, if we actually do the loop integrals to get the amplitude and not just the integrand, then we should get an object that depends on deltas. And perhaps that object has some resemblance to gravity amplitudes. Or again, this is there's no polarization here. So it's a scalar avatar of uh, gravity amplitudes, which means something that's totally permutation invariant, no color and so on. So we can begin, for example, by looking at the three punctured sphere. Okay, so we have the three punctured sphere as a trace by cube uh, diagram. Uh, as a trace by cube thing, this would just correspond to some two loop vacuum graphs. So if we just do the two loop integrals and find out alpha prime, we just get some number here. Okay, so that's fine. We can dually think about this as a three graviton, quote unquote, three graviton amplitude that should just be a number. Now, if we go to the four punctured sphere, now, again, uh, this is a, some three loop vacuum graph as a trace by cube theory. So if we do the integral of the loop momenta, we're just left with the dependence on the deltas. Okay? Now the deltas are, there's a delta for S, for T and for U, and, and actually all the other deltas with more complicated surfaces are, are, are homologous to these. So these are the only deltas uh, that we have, which, are, uh, which give us a good parametrization of the STU kinematics and also homologically the sum of these curves is indeed equal to zero, which is S plus T plus U equals zero. So we get some function of the deltas after we do these loop integrals. What is that function? Could it be that we get something that looks like a Vera Thor Shapiro amplitude out of this? We don't know. That's something that we're looking at clearly as singularities. Uh, it, it, has, uh, it has singularities corresponding to these pinchings. But um, exactly the structure, what it looks like, and so on, we don't yet know. But in principle, this is a way of associating the variables that we would associate with gravity amplitudes, um, uh, some way of extracting them from this, uh, from this uh, uh, binary geometry and doing the uh, loop integral. Again, all these loop integrals are just trivial Gaussian integrals. We're just left with an integral over these y variables that are associated with the corresponding. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about um, uh, this, uh, uh, this one loop story. And I just wanna end with the totally obvious question that I hope I have uh, turned into a burning one in your, in your mind. It's the, certainly what's the preoccupying us now. What the hell are these stringy amplitudes? Um, uh, they're very naturally defined associated with these surfaces. They have all these qualitative properties in common with string amplitudes. What are they? Are they a new kind of string theory? I think it's more likely that some new view of what string theory is, some new way of uh, thinking about uh, um, uh, uh, amplitudes in uh, string theory. Um, uh, note that there's no world sheet, no CFT. Um, just practically speaking, there's no elliptic functions or anything at one loop. Okay, so um, another difference. Well, uh, so far we've seen no critical dimension. We've seen um, no infinities associated with the bubbles and the tadpoles, or they are there but we can control them just by putting in variables associated with the bubbles and the tadpoles. So these are all things that are not quite the same as ordinary string theory. And obviously it's not gonna be literally some actual string background because we don't know an actual non supersymmetric string background gives us this uh, trace by cube thing. But it could, be that it's, uh, it could be that it's related to some way of parametrizing the moduli space from a very different point of view. Um, and, uh, and, and connecting to string theory in that way. A huge question in this uh, business, going all the way back to tree level, is somehow the trace by cube structure is all about the universal factorizations that we have at long distances for any theory. Um, but we know that the real physics we care about has polarization vectors uh, for Yang-Mills and for gravity. 
So uh, the question is not only how can we add polarization to this sort of uh, positive geometric way of thinking about this physics, but what's the raison d'etre of polarization vectors from this point of view? Why do we need them? Why are they forced on us in some way? That we don't yet know, but clearly we need something to understand that question all the way back at tree level even um, in order to see whether literally getting angles and, 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 and maybe even uh, uh, GR, uh, real, real gravity out of this might uh, happen. Uh, let me just sort of end by, by mentioning why it's not trivial to compare this with ordinary uh, string theory. We want the sort of conceptual differences. And it, it really boils down to the fact that we have very different views of the type Mueller space or the moduli space that we're used to thinking about when we do string integrals. Let's do a really simple example of this bubble diagram, okay? In conventional string theory, there's a two-dimensional moduli space in here, okay? And uh, I have two points on the outside in this little circle uh, with some size r. It's a two-dimensional moduli space, and the standard way of parameterizing this, if you're a world tree person, would be in, ter in terms of the radius of this little annulus and the angle around the outside. So this is the sort of R theta way of thinking about uh, the world tree. And where does this come from? It comes from the fact that in the standard way of thinking about string theory, we think about the, the world sheet metric in a totally local way. We re really imagine there's a metric at every point on the world sheet up to vial rescaling, and that's what we think about. On the other hand, our way of thinking about the um, uh, moduli space or the uh, Teichmuller space uh, and this is the connection between all the things that we're talking about in hyperbolic geometry that I've said nothing about, but which you can look at some of Julio's lovely talks at recent meetings where he'd spent a little bit more time talking about this. Um, uh, but, but basically, you know, our variables are these arcs. And we think about the geometry of the surface, not by giving the metric locally on the surface, but by specifying all these geodesic lengths of all these arcs. So it's a more global way of thinking about it. We don't have a local access to the metric on the world sheet. We have a global access via specifying the lengths of all these geodesics. So they're both two-dimensional moduli spaces, but there's a very non-trivial mapping between these two sets of variables. And I actually very highly doubt, I mean, you can in principle write it down, but there's a, I, we certainly don't know any practical map between these two sets of variables. And it's furthermore highly unlikely that even though such a map existed, you would just take that map, shove it into the usual string integrand, and out would pop this one. They're very unlikely to be the same as each other, but they may well be the same up to total derivatives. Okay, so, so this is very likely just a very different way of thinking about the integral of the moduli space uh, from the point of view of thinking about the geodesics on the surface rather than locally uh, thinking in terms of the matrix on the surface. And that has another consequence which is a, a, as alpha prime goes to zero, what the usual world sheet picture lands on is the world line formalism. And as alpha prime goes to zero, the sort of, the picture that the string is unifying everything gets broken up into individual Feynman diagrams for different processes. Okay, that's the world line picture. But that's not what we get. Our picture as alpha prime goes to zero lands us on the canonical form of the surface hedron. You see, the surface hedron already is doing something stringy, even at alpha prime goes to zero. Even at alpha prime goes to zero, it's a master object that unifies all the diagrams together in one big thing. Okay, so it still sees them all unified. And this is matching not to the world line picture of the physics, but to the field theory picture of the physics, most obviously seeing the fact that we can naturally, if we don't do the loop integrals, we can actually naturally land on an integrand. Uh, and that's the sort of starting point to something that looks like the integrand. Um, that's the starting point that's naturally associated with this way of thinking about the combinatorics in the geometry, which we can later do loop integrals to, 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 to get uh, amplitudes. But, but, uh, but, but the integrand itself is something which is, uh, which is uh, handed to us in this picture. Certainly not something that's sort of obvious from the world line uh, form. Okay, so, so this is why it's not trivial to compare these things and why it's not inconceivable that this is uh, just a very different way of thinking about what string theory is. Um, which really begins with something sort of fundamentally more unified and sort of strings without stringsy, um, already at alpha prime goes to zero with the surface hedron, which then uh, sort of miraculously blows up uh, into this binary object uh, that we can extend some <clears throat> even at finite alpha prime. All right, so that's all uh, I wanted to say. Um, uh, uh, the final topic, but I think uh, what we can decide how many people are, 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 uh, are willing to like uh, stay up and, and, and talk about this, um, 
is where does this magic come from? So, so I, I explained to, to some extent where the surfacedron uh, comes from uh, in general. So thinking about the surfacedron, uh, it's, that, that's something that you can explain to a kid in grade eight. Okay, so it's all just uh, adding vectors, even easier than the amphitohedron that you can explain to someone in grade 11. You don't even need to know anything about determinants. Okay, so this is all about drawing curves on surfaces and relations, linear relations between them and so on. Okay, so, uh, so the, the surfacedron is a very simple object. Um, uh, the, uh, if you just want to, from there, go up to discover these binary geometries, then, uh, and as, as was done in the development, um, uh, it, there, it's, it seems sort of rather miraculous that it's possible to real, give these guys uh, a, a binary uh, definition. And in the finite type cluster algebra cases, there are some uh, uh, explanation for it. But we're well beyond those finite type cluster algebra cases. And as I stressed, even, even the finite cases are not quite cluster. It's just dn hats and not dn, for example. Um, so, uh, so there has to be something deeper explaining the origin of these miracles. And that has to do with, uh, the, this, uh, with quiver categories. Um, this really is one level of sort of abstraction beyond the things that we've been talking about in this uh, subject so far. But I find it astonishingly beautiful. Uh, and it does give a totally conceptual, if quite sort of deep and alien origin of these um, uh, binary geometry magic. But anyway, um, uh, but, uh, perhaps uh, we can stop now and uh, clap. Um, and if anyone is interested in hearing uh, anything about that, I'm happy to do that later. But, but, but this looks like a good time to stop. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I see some hands up. Good, uh, David. Uh... Oh, yes, you're plotting. Well, <laughs> um, uh, uh, David Broder, you have a, have a hand up. Yeah, yes, uh, thank you, Nima. Uh, thank you to the organizers for scheduling this at the end of a busy day. Um, I, I stayed listening, Nima, and I picked up several times during your talk, but particularly at the end, the following picture, that your stringification has nothing a priori to do with string theory. It's an ultraviolet regularization. And when you introduce your alpha primes, you end up with mathematical expressions at finite alpha primes, which are much more simple than those of string theory. And then you- Well, we, we, we have some, we have, we have integral expressions, uh, but, but we have integral expressions. We, we're exploring what the actual functions look like and trying to compare them with what we, what we get. In, you see, the actual integral expressions uh, in string theory look more complicated. Uh, um, uh, 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 but uh, we're trying uh, to compare uh, what the final answers look like uh, to see if physically uh, they're actually the same. Right. It's certainly uh, a very different representation. We don't know uh, 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 if it's actually the same in some hidden way or not. So please go back to that very explicit expression for the one loop four point function yes, yes. that you gave. Yes. And, and, and make a, 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 and when you show that, I'll try to ask my question. Sure. Hopefully without being interrupted. Sorry about that. There. Okay, so 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 this is an amplitude, yes. Yep. Okay, and it depends upon certain parameters and and certain masses and regularizations. To what question is that the answer? Four point uh, four point uh, uh, amplitude in this trace by cube theory. Uh, uh, and is this something that would be attained in the identical expression by different methods that you've done that economically? by a stringified expressions, which are- um... That's part of the problem. That is part of the problem is that, for, for example, in, in string theory, strictly speaking, uh, for any non-supersymmetric example, there'll be divergences everywhere because, yes. uh, because we have these tadpoles and mass numbers, all those things are divergent. So first so of all, a... there, there, there's that. But we, we can ignore that and say, well, maybe we should compare. And so, but that, that, that tells you, first of all, that, that we're not going to, we're not going to on the nose match this function with something you're going to get from string theory because here we have something non supersymmetric there's no sensible non supersymmetric string theory at one loop okay so we're going to get all the divergences that we expect to uh, get there but you could but you see we would also have those divergences if i didn't sort of regulate this mass normalization and the tadpole uh sort of by hand here so you might think, okay, um, and, and those divergences in string theory are actually interpreted as generating a potential so the dilaton runs away and so on. 
So you, you might think that uh, this is kind of a, this is a good thing. Maybe, maybe this is letting me uh, uh, bypass the sort of first obstacle, and maybe I should see what the S and T dependence looks like and compare that to what I would get in a sensible supersymmetric string theory. Or perhaps there is some version of this uh, object that we're talking about here, which would supersymmetrize it in such a way that would remove all the dependence on these little m squared, capital T, and the capital M squared parameters. I don't know. Okay? But that's the zeroth order difficulty for why we don't yet know how to just compare. Say this is this formula equals that formula. So what I we want can to do is look at the, the qualitative behavior, um, which is what I uh, told you about. Um, we can also look at the alpha prime expansion. That's something that we're looking at to see if we can sort of identify uh, the kind of numbers that show up in the two expansions to see if there's any qualitative similarity there. Um, but uh, yeah, so but the answer to your question is no. Unfortunately, uh, there is no sort of known string answer that would uh, that I can directly compare to this because there's no known string background that uh, is not supersymmetric and, and allows me to do this calculation. So it's, it's an ultraviolet regularization of a question that doesn't exist. It's, yes. No, no, it, it, the, the question exists perfectly sensibly in the trace five cube theory. And there, there, it's a, there it's a perfectly good answer. There, you see in the, in, in the trace five cube theory, it's actually good to have all these parameters because they actually, the M squared is giving you the master normalization of the external leg. The capital T is the, uh, is the, is the bed of the field thought. Um, uh, so it, it's all good. I mean, in other words, if you're if you're if you're summing these diagrams in the phi cube theory, um, then you would have, uh, in addition to the usual ultraviolet divergences, which you'd have, have there in high enough dimensions, um, you'd also have these sort of stupid infrared divergences from the one over zeros in these propagators, right? Yeah. And those yeah. we know how to deal with. That's just telling me I have to shift the vacuum. That's the tadpole, or I have yeah. to shift what I mean by the mass of the particle. That's the that's the uh, uh, this 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 guy here, right? So we know that. Uh, uh, so in practice, we know that if I were to do these uh, calculations in the field theory, and I encountered these two diagrams, well, I know that here I just put in a one over m squared instead of one over zero, and I put some sort of capital T there instead of a, a one over zero, and I yep. would move on, and I'd do the loop integrals, and I'd sum them. Okay, so I'm getting an ultraviolet regularization of that. Okay, so all the actual UV divergences, the non-trivial UV divergences in the loop integrals are, are all gone. And uh, what, what, but, but when I get this uh, finite expression. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Wow. <laughs> It is uh, nearly midnight Europe time anyway. <laughs> I, I think there might be some people in uh, China too. So, which uh, I guess actually is not as crazy, but um, it was a little while ago. Well, if there aren't any further questions, um, let's all thank Nima again. <laughs> Excellent job, Nima. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> All right, um, we will reconvene tomorrow morning at uh, in Europe, it'll be at one o'clock. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>